No, no, no problem. And then I did shoot um, Victor an email saying, hey, if you want you know, some consultant um, support, if you wanted to put a permanent camera in here, because of, I can just see them once they realize that they're on the air, that they may want, like, they really, for you to have a switcher or something like that. So okay. that might be a future conversation for us and, and oh, okay. Victor to talk about. Okay. So I can just see that coming. Okay. Right. Because right. they just have to get used to that actually. Now that people are going to be paying attention to right. so what they're okay. saying, could be a game changer. So okay. we do have pick funds for that, so that okay. would be helpful. Okay, yeah. thanks for the heads up. No, sure. I, I, I appreciate all that. Oh, no, absolutely. No, thank you. We'd like to hear it. Okay, so it, uh, two things. Is, is it something that's on an agenda item? Okay, then they'll say uh, if anyone has something they want to bring to the attention that's not on the agenda, then you would get up, go around, and go to the microphone over there, the podium. And then if you uh, if you're representing yourself, you have I think it's like two minutes, three minutes, and then if you're representing good evening, if you're representing uh, an organization, you have to get a little bit more. And you're being recorded. <laughs> Unless you want them to, 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 to no. look, okay. Then, then you would just tell them that I have some handouts uh, that I'll share with you. Uh, you know. Should I say that at the end? I would say that in the beginning. Oh, oh you can say it in the beginning or the end. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Say it at the end and, and they'll say, well, come on up and, and then uh, you can just hand me one. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> So, uh, so we'll have, since 
Good evening. I'd like to call this meeting of the City Council to order. And would you please rise and we'll have a moment of we'll have a pledge of allegiance followed by a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible. Dillis? Here. Vice Mayor Johnson? Here. Councilmember Lind? Here. Councilmember Tim? Here. Councilmember Reed? I should point out Councilmember Reed contacted me earlier today and said he'd likely be 15 minutes late. With that, we'll move to committee reports and I'll start with Councilmember Lind. Right. Hmm. This uh, had a Metro board meeting and uh, we're dealing with uh, budget issues and a 10 year strategic uh, budget plan, an update on that, and uh, some employee negotiations. And uh, had some new board members uh, sworn in, and um, one of our most senior long term board members, a um, real special person that we said goodbye to. But uh, other than that, uh, that and uh, as an alternate this time, even though I accidentally voted, <laughs> on. on uh, Santa Margarita Groundwater Sustainability uh, Action. I'm sure Mayor Dillis will mention the upcoming uh, workshop Saturday. Thank you. Vice Mayor Johnson. I'm uh, to report, Mayor. Council Member Tim. I had the pleasure of attending the Housing Solution Forums uh, with our mayor, and we were able to uh, go to the Silicon Valley Leadership Group. They did put on a, a really good forum focused on some of the coming changes uh, from the state in housing. They had the heads of all the Bay Area Transit groups there, as well as the CASA group, and um, the uh, Senator Weiner and Senator Chu, who are going over Senate Bill 50's impact. So I don't know if you want to expand on that at all, but that was uh, something we got to attend this last week. Here, I, forgot. I forgot one yes. thing that does apply. We had a LAFCO this mor meeting this morning, and I was uh, part of approval of an annexation on Coombray here in the city of Scotts Valley that's been in the process for a period of time. And uh, real motivation for that annexation was to protect the uh, forest land and just protect the environment around the uh, the end of Hungary. So nice for the homeowner, nice for the city as well. So. Great, thank you. Um, my reports, I did attend the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency meeting and um, as Councilman Lind indicated, there are a couple more informational um, workshops coming up put on by the Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency at the Felton Community Hall. One is on February 9th, no, I'm sorry, on uh, yeah, February 9th, and one is on March 9th. And um, the first one is on water budgets, how do we balance all our needs? And the second is on managing groundwater, how do we prepare for an uncertain future? And I attended, uh, we both attended the last session, uh, and it was excellent. And even though it was several hours long, it went by very quickly because we were engaged and we were getting great information. So I encourage folks to uh, attend those workshops if you are able. Um, I did also attend the um, Silicon Valley Leadership Group session on housing that uh, Councilmember Tim mentioned. And I, um, I found it very informational, um, good, a good group. Uh, Great presentations. I was somewhat disturbed by the presentations by uh, Senator Weiner and uh, Assemblymember Chu uh, about SB 50, which uh, is a follow-up to a bill that was um, proposed last year that failed. Uh, this one would not. This one isn't about putting 10-story, allowing 10-story apartment buildings near transit centers, but they've got it down to 55 feet or five stories. So there's and there's some other egregious language in there. So. Basically, I'm concerned about, even though we need housing, I'm concerned about the takeaway of local control. And so I know we're, in talking with the city manager, we're uh, 
we're looking forward to hearing what guidance we can get from League of California Cities to get the, the biggest bang for, for our opinion. So uh, I'll be watching that to see where that goes. I also attended what's called the City Select Committee. Uh, it's a monthly meeting of the mayors, the county administrative officer, and city managers. And um, we'll just let you know that our appointments to the Monterey Bay Community Power Policy and Operations Boards were confirmed. The Select Committee makes those appointments to the Monterey Bay Power uh, Community Power uh, Group. And I also attended the Monterey Bay Power Monterey Bay Community Power Policy Board meeting, um, where basically we were uh, giving feedback to the negotiating team about the compensation that this, the CEO of this organization would get. So it was an interesting meeting for me, my first meeting. And that ends my uh, committee report. And we'll move on to the city manager's report. All right, well thank you, Mayor. Just have four items for you this evening wanted to remind the community that the Town Center developers will be holding two community meetings uh, tomorrow, Thursday, February 7th, one at 1.30, the other at 8 o'clock, and both meetings will be held at the Community Center. Uh, there is also a uh, police, sheriff, and security job fair that's going to be held this weekend. Uh, the City of Scotts Valley Police Department, along with other area law enforcement, will be participating in a job expo. And it will be from noon to 5 this Saturday, February 9th at the Kaiser Permanente Arena in Santa Cruz. And so applicants are going to have an opportunity to learn more about the oral interview process, required background investigations, the academy experience, field training, etc. And there will also be a live non-lethal force and canine demonstration, so that should be very interesting. Um, also, the Scotts Valley Middle School ribbon cutting and gym dedication is scheduled for this Sunday, February 10th. Um, at 3.15, and there will also going to be an open house held between 3 and 4, so if people want to come out and take a tour of the new facility, they can do that. I would encourage them to do so. It's, it's absolutely phenomenal, so so glad it's, it's finally done. And then finally, we have a general plan advisory committee, uh, what we call GPAC meeting, will be held on Monday, February 11th from 6 to 8 in the City Hall Council Chambers. And this agenda is going to be about mobility issues, so we'll kind of do a Mobility 101 talking about, uh, and mobility is just beyond just um, vehicles, right? It's about pedestrian and how we move around throughout the city. So it should be a very um, interesting transition as we get into the meat of the GPAC, and I'll be focused on mobility and land use over the next six months. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to public comment time. This is an opportunity for anyone to speak to us about anything that's not on the agenda, and you are limited to three minutes. If anyone would like to speak to us, just please come forward. Hi, I'm Rabia Barkins, and I wonder how many of you would do anything for advanced technology even if the chances of getting cancer could skyrocket. How many of you would trade sound sleep, memory, or brain function for cellular technology? That is exactly what you are doing if you are supporting 5G, that's fifth generation cellular wireless technology in your city. I've been a health professional for over 35 years, and I am concerned. The guidelines for 5G don't allow the local governments to make decisions based on health risks. Telecom companies and the Federal Communication Commission's FCC sweep the health risks under the rug. 5G has never been tested on humans or the environment. We will be guinea pigs as part of the largest experiment on Earth. Five cell radiation will be aimed right into your house with cell antennas located every one to eight houses on light poles, utility poles, and traffic light poles. There is no way to get away from the hazardous radiation. The FCC and telecom companies state the cell tower radiation is safe based on the outdated 1996 FCC guidelines which measure thermal heat damage to the body. Over a thousand peer-reviewed studies have shown non-thermal biological damage 
with the current cell radiation, ranging from cancer to brain damage. We don't feel these actual effects with 3 and 4G because most people are not next to cell towers. Did you know fire stations are exempt from having cell towers on their rooftops because firemen who stayed in the station became non-functional? Do you think 5G with 90 gigahertz stronger current than 3 to 4G might damage human health? Children and elderly are much more susceptible to biological damage, especially the brain, and we have 55 plus communities and schools in Scotts Valley. City Council and citizens, please take this seriously and learn about 5G cellular technology to protect yourself and have a workshop. The County of Marin had a workshop last night to discuss taking control locally. You can view it online. Now listen, if you have questions, you could also go to www.ehtrust.org. That's environmental health trust.org. Thank, Thank you. you. Can I have handouts? You, you can have them too. You know, from here? Yes. You know, usually, um, to be honest with you, I look at scans sometimes at the issues that she just brought up, but I have been hearing things about you know, 5G that uh, are a little bit uh, concerning. So I'm not saying that we would, you know, um, explore that as a counselor or whatever, but um, it, it's got my attention a little bit. So I'm going to learn more about it. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Would anyone else like to speak to us about something on the agenda? And just to be clear, when the when the light hits red, then uh, that's your three minutes for up. So please tell us what's on your mind. Thank you for, very much, City Council, for this opportunity to speak. <clears throat> and I'd also like to add to Rabia's comments about 5G. Um, 5G uh, will be a, a spectrum of uh, waves called millimeter wave frequency. Right now, we're at about 3G. 3G, just to give you some numbers so you can make relationships, 3G is 1.6 to 2.4 gigahertz. 5G will be 24 to 90, say some scientists, gigahertz, or 24 to 100 gigahertz, which will be, um, it will be changeable by AI, artificial intelligence. Um, at 60 gigahertz, the human body cannot absorb oxygen from your hemoglobin. Millimeter wavelengths are considered militarized, weaponized by the military. They use them to crowd control if they want groups to break up. It's because it heats up the skin that frequency makes your cells like antennas and it absorbs the heat. You feel like you're literally on fire. So people run, walk away. They also use it to control the minds of the enemy. It can alter brain frequencies. Um, at the airports right now, there are reports of security agents who are working with the ProVision security uh, machines that scan airplane, airplane passengers. They are in the millimeter wavelength frequencies at some airports. At one of the airports most recently, a woman who came she came to a reporter and she explained what is going on with her group of NSA agents. She herself now has cancer. 38 in her group working around these millimeter wave machines either 
are have passed away, have stage three and stage four cancer. That is terminal usually. The others have autoimmune. And what's interesting, like Rabia, I have been in the health field for many years. Uh, the autoimmune conditions are not on one tissue type. Because these are so high radiation, usually your brain, your thyroid, and your heart, and your sexual organs usually uh, will radiate faster. But these are different autoimmune conditions that these agents have, got, have gotten and, and are dealing with. We feel it's very dangerous technology to human biology and it damages heart, eyes, and I would like to thank you for letting me speak. I feel this is the apocalypse if we go to 5G and it is really something to be afraid of. Thank you very much. Would anyone, anyone else like to speak to us about anything not on the agenda? Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> Any council members have something to say? Yeah, I just um, want to announce that uh, this Saturday is our uh, upcoming Fallen Officer Foundation Ball. I know several in this room are attending, and we thank you for the support. And it will be at the Coconut Grove from 5 to 11. The, uh, the Fallen Officer Board is comprised of volunteers, so 99% of what we raise goes back to actually helping our local first responders, firefighters and police officers. And um, we've had tremendous community support from our merchants and, and local businesses with sponsorships and donations, and, and uh, we look forward to a successful event and want to thank the community of Scotts Valley for their ongoing support. Anyone else? Okay, we'll move on to alterations to consent agenda. City Manager, do you have any adjustments? There are none. Council members? No. Is anyone in the public interested in discussing anything or pulling something off the consent agenda? Seeing none, can I have a motion to... Move approval. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. And move on to alterations to the regular agenda. And there are none. Council. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. And we'll move on to item one, economic development presentation from Interwider DeLamas and Associates. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have invited Ken uh, Norhoff from HDL, and he will be giving us a presentation on sales tax and retail trends from a national, state, and local perspective. Also very specific to Scotts Valley, which I'll find, I think you'll find very interesting. So Ken, the floor is yours. Uh, Mayor and City Council, staff and community members, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Ken Nordoff. I'm a principal with HDL Companies, and I'm going to spend a few minutes going through a lot of information centered around sales tax, but I hope you'll find it both informative and if it stimulates some questions, I'll be prepared to answer those for you. So I thought I would just start with some basics. Uh, just to make sure everybody's understanding sales and use tax. We're talking about taxes that are paid on tangible personal property. Uh, currently in California, real property and services are excluded. Uh, this tax started back in the 1930s and has evolved over a long period of time. It's an end user charge. Through a series of legislative processes, there are sizable amounts of money that are now exempt, where we used to collect sales tax in California. And we've got a fairly small number of businesses that are uh, when you aggregate them, are, are generating most of the tax that we uh, see across California. Uh, this has become more complicated, but where does the money go? So traditionally, you'd walk in a store and you'd pay a rate and the money would stay locally, and that's still true today, because um, we're tracking a sales office or where a transaction occurs. But particularly with the advent of technology, we have a lot of out-of-state ordering. Some of those orders are filled out-of-state, some are filled in-state, that dictates where those sales tax dollars flow. Uh, we have some regulations that have come out of the state agency that oversees sales tax. That's the California Department of Tax and Fee Administration that distributes some of the money administratively for ease on what's called a pooled basis. 
So the money gets pooled, and rather than coming back directly to a local agency, you kind of share in that under a formula each and every quarter. And then there are even some limits. The last bullet there is talking about out of state, it's typically equipment, telecom, uh, energy utility. At a certain price point, over a half a million dollars, actually those dollars are directed back to the local agency rather than going into the pool. Uh, this chart, which is probably going to be a little hard to read, and frankly, it's only a partial example, is trying to highlight for you on the left uh, where an item is ordered from, in state or out of state, and then secondarily, where are the goods being shipped from, in state or out of state. And the column on the right is identifying whether the local jurisdiction or the countywide pool is a recipient of those tax dollars. This is probably about half the length of the whole chart if you were to flow through all the variables in the ways that goods are ordered and shipped and delivered uh, today. I want to point out a, a little bit of a distinction. Uh, this is particularly applicable because you have a local transaction tax measure U. And so there are some nuances. Uh, sales tax typically has been a point of sale uh, that the dollars flow into the store or business where that goes. District or transaction taxes follow where those products are delivered. Automobiles are a good example of that. The dealership is getting the 1% Bradley Burns sales tax rate when a person goes in and buys a car. But if there is a district tax based on where that vehicle is registered, so your residents buying cars are paying that tax and that money is coming back to you under Measure U, regardless of where they purchase that vehicle. So there's some nuances between these, these different types of sales taxes. Uh, the statewide rate, so uh, the current rate, uh, which is split really across the state general fund, there's some local allocations for public safety, health and welfare under realignment revenues, but the, the aggregate rate there is 7.25%. The city gets 1% of that 7.25% that goes into your general fund, as this, uh, which is referred to as the Bradley Burns Law when this was put into place. There's also a quarter percent uh, in that local rate that goes to your county transportation authority or agency, and they use that for transportation-related purposes. In addition to the base rate, there's the ability to have local voters impose transaction taxes, but under state law, there's a 2% cap. That chart is trying to show you there's a couple of counties or other areas that have exceptions, but generally that cap rate is 9.25%. Rate here in Scotts Valley, when we kind of pull out that data, uh, is currently 9%. So you've got that 7.25% base rate. You've got your local measure U rate at a half percent. Uh, Santa Cruz Metro has another half percent. That's a rate that's been in existence, I think, dating back several decades. You've got a countywide library tax. It's a quarter of 1%. And then you've got an additional uh, measure D transportation uh, rate in there for another half percent. So when you stack all that together, you're at a nine percent rate, leaving you a quarter percent under that nine and a quarter percent cap or two percent uh, factor that you can Im have, have voters imposing locally. There are legislative processes that have been uh, pursued by other agencies to go above that, but absent that solution, uh, the rate here would cap out at nine and a quarter percent. Whether the city was to do something or whether another local government agency was to do something. It's available to not just yourselves. So um, the tax base here in Scotts Valley, uh, this is the sales tax distribution. We break all of your revenues down into eight groups uh, and you, you've got, a, when we look at your base, you, you're fairly dominant in that uh, brown wedge, which is a uh, food and drug. Uh, general consumer goods is kind of that orange wedge, and then you've got a fair number of restaurants, which will include everything from casual dining to coffee shops in that blue pie wedge. I want to point out that the auto and transportation, the yellow there, is fairly small, and that the gray wedge up at the top, the state and county pool, is the, is the distribution that comes back under the countywide pool allocation. I put this slide in to contrast it with your Measure U distribution, where you will notice that your auto and transportation is a much more sizable part of that tax resource for you, and the pools go away, and most of the other pieces stay generally unchanged. So I want to talk about trends. I'm going to do that in a couple of ways. I'm going to talk about some 
regional data here on the central coast and within the county, but then I'm also going to talk about things that are occurring just more broadly with um, where sales tax is trending. So there's a lot of ways to illustrate this, but this is one chart that shows as, uh, this is looking back over 20 years at per capita household income, and you can see that's rising, you know, there's a little bit of a recession period in there, but then when you overlay that yellow line, which is the sales tax per capita, it's essentially flat. So it's, it's losing ground in terms of um, a resource that's keeping up with your cost of service delivery and capital needs, et cetera. This is a chart, again, on a per capita basis, looking at the Central Coast region. So we take our statewide data, we break that into regions, and we have five counties here along the Central Coast. The Santa Cruz County is that dark green line. This is a chart that looks back 13 years. So you can kind of see the pre-recession lines on the left, and then you obviously see the dip. And there's been a fairly steady and reasonable recovery, uh, not just on the Central Coast, but statewide. Uh, charts are similar, so that, that's, been, um, that's been good. Uh, an area like San Benito County has been growing a lot, and so that's also helping contribute to the results that look like they may be climbing faster than uh, other, other counties within the, the Central Coast region. Uh, here we're taking the um, same kind of per capita look, but we're just looking at 13 quarters instead of 13 years. So this is kind of taking the, the previous chart's right side and just giving you more of a sense of what's happening within those same counties over the last three plus years. Um, it's a little uh, sporadic, kind of depending what's going on. The bases uh, in those fourth quarter uh, columns tend to have a lot of general consumer goods and holiday spending, and then they tend to dip off in the first quarter. But again, uh, with some exception, the lines are either kind of generally flat or trending upward slightly. Yes? So these last two graphs are, um, I wouldn't say they're shocking, but um, I don't quite understand the delta, the difference between, you know, Santa Cruz County and San Luis or, or um, San Luis Obispo County. I mean, one is kind of off the charts, yeah. and the other one is like uh, in the in the, in the doldrums. Help me understand a little bit why that is. Yeah, so uh, the math behind the line graphs are looking at, on a quarter-to-quarter -quarter basis, we're looking at the number of retailer, retail counts, that's what you see on the left under each of the five counties. We're looking at the tax that those retailers generate each quarter, and then we're dividing that by the population of those counties. So there's just a lot more stores and retail outlets in San Luis Obispo, mm -hmm. say, than, and when you say Santa Cruz County, are you restricting that just to Scotts Valley? No, I'm saying county what? I'm saying everybody within the county. Oh, so the count is the number of, of retailers. retailers within the, the whole of each of those five counties. Right. I I have some more slides in a minute that will get more specific. Right. I'm trying to start wider and I'll, right. I'll narrow down a little bit. Jump, jump the count. No, no, that's okay. It's a good question. It's a good question. Um, thank you. Okay. Uh, so another way we, we uh, assist your staff and try to look at the data is to take, and this is just within Santa Cruz County now, so I'm getting a little narrower, uh, but trying to look at um, those eight segments I mentioned in, in the pie wedges earlier uh, are the way that we group uh, sales taxes. And so at the very top there, you're going to see uh, general consumer goods. So this is um, malls, uh, retail centers, women's apparel, men's apparel, specialty stores, electronics are all in that top grouping. And then right underneath that are restaurants and hotels. Uh, and then you can kind of see the rest of the groupings that flow there. Uh, it's not surprising in this chart to me, not just unique to Santa Cruz County, that general consumer goods are struggling, and you probably already know that. This is just visual evidence of that. Um, restaurants have generally been doing well because people are still favoring to eat out, and I, I continue to point out where possible state and county pools. So this is where historically we really weren't collecting out-of-state money. There was uh, some legislation, AB 155, that started in 2012 where we started seeing money flowing in from Amazon, at least for their products and some other online retailers, has helped grow the county pool. And then the recent Supreme Court decision, the Wayfair decision, is going to add money to that going forward 
where the state agency, CDTFA, is going to start collecting that in April. So pools are becoming a more significant component of most agencies' taxes where they didn't exist 10 or 20 years ago. Uh, your own chart here in Scotts Valley, I, I looked at this a couple times and I go, it's a really interesting rainbow. Um, <laughs> so things uh, three or so years ago were generally kind of bundled together when you're looking at those same industries. Uh, but you can see certainly probably where you've made some intentional investment, you've seen some business investment uh, in things like restaurants that's been trending up. Uh, the pools are the same when you look at the fuel situation. Most of that is a function of price, not consumption. And so uh, prices on, on gasoline and diesel have been rising over the last couple of years. And then you can kind of go all the way to the bottom line there, that kind of yellowish light green color where you have auto and transportation, which has generally been fairly flat. So, um, so there's quite a bit of movement there, but that's, that is the trend. And when we put these charts up, we try to do that in a way where we're showing you the economic data, meaning that where there were exceptions in the quarterly reports for late payments or missing payments, we kind of take all that out of there. So it's just trying to give you a, a picture of where some of your major sectors have been trending over the last three years. Yes? So in Scotts Valley quarter, 13 quarter trends, you see state and county pools. It bottoms out on first quarter of 2018 and then just takes a terrific rise. Yeah, so there was a, a large um, correction, not just to Scotts Valley, but statewide. It had to do with a supplier of um, a sale of office and computer equipment, and, and it was a 30 or 40 million dollar statewide adjustment that kind of showed up one quarter and then went away. So it's an aberration, um, but it was a, a settlement between a couple of agencies, the taxpayer and the state agency, and so that adjustment materialized here as it did many other places. So I'm going to shift off looking at charts and tables and graphs and talk a little bit about some other elements of what's changing or trending. So one thing is certainly shopping habits. Um, and in, embedded in that is just the way we're doing things today. So shoppers are more price conscious. Um, there's a lot of shared economy that doesn't generate sales tax revenue. Um, and there's a focus more on experiences and less about buying things that are subject to sales tax, tangible personal property. I like to use it as an example. You might remember we used to go to Blockbuster and buy things. You know, we'd buy DVDs or videos. That generated sales tax in today's Netflix and Hulu downloading world. No sales tax. And there's lots of illustrations of that. So it kind of highlights how the, the, the economy and the world has shifted. Our sales tax structure has not kept up with it. So I have another question. Yes. Okay. So, um, first of all, share it, shared economy or sharing economy, help. what is that? Uh, ride share, Uber and Lyft, not generating revenue. Oh. Um, Airbnb, okay. you know, not generating revenue. Mm -hmm. a, lot of, a lot of things that are, you could think of more as rentals or temporary uses as opposed to acquisition have, have an effect on sales tax. So, I have, give me, I, I have a, a psychological question. So, is that for me? <laughs> um, so what you're describing is a, a shift, say you mentioned Blockbuster to digital downloads for Netflix and, and Hulu and so forth. So in the minds of the consumer, do they view that, um, uh, are they, number one, are they conscious of the fact that they're not paying the taxes anymore? And secondly, is there a fairness or equity, um, I guess, equation in their minds that, hey, uh, maybe we should be, or, or when they learn that they're not, is it, does it register with them, or is, it, is that really beyond your scope here? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think generally consumers, I don't think really pay a lot of attention to sales tax in any circumstance unless mm -hmm. something they're buying or doing kind of provokes that thought. So if I could use a personal illustration, I was, at, I was in Washington uh, visiting my daughter, and uh, we went to a distillery and bought some whiskey. And I knew there was a sales tax, and I just assumed I'd pay it. But it turned out I didn't know the tax rate on those kinds of beverages in Washington is 20%. I assumed it was like 6% of the rest. So that, that's a personal illustration of where something caught my attention. But by and large, 
people aren't paying any attention to this stuff. Um, so, so probably if you have a twenty percent sales tax, especially on something like whiskey or alcohol mm -hmm. beverage, beverage, they're coupling the uh, maybe the physical or uh, effects of alcohol, mm -hmm. and they rationalize that that higher number because Correct. it might have an effect on you know the social. Um, effect. Yeah, they may redirect that into programs, mental health, or other programs that are necessary to support that. Sure. The state does. I mean, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, Mayor? I have a question. Um, is aging a factor? As our society ages, uh, do, as we age, do we spend less? Yeah. And is that, is that a factor in what's going on? Definitely. Also? I didn't say that, but uh, people particularly get retirement age, and they're, they've probably acquired a lot of the things they feel like they need to acquire in their life, and they're spending it on travel and experiences and less on things that generate sales tax. Absolutely. And the other end of that is the millennial or younger generation that is just less prone to acquiring. They're, they're very comfortable in sharing and renting and using and turning it back over. And so like, there's kind of both ends of the demographic. Interesting. So uh, this won't surprise you, but uh, trend number two, consumers are moving online. So that might be a little hard to read, but we took the entire state statewide sales tax. The orange line at the top is what we call the point of sale revenue, meaning what came out of the brick and mortar stores. And that bottom blue line is the pools. So pools back, uh, meaning online sales, online sales back in 2000 were only 4% of the total of sales tax in California. They ended uh, calendar year 2017 at 16%, and they're continuing to move in that direction. So even sales tax is growing a little bit. You can see at the end there, it's up about 10% over the last five years, up through 2017, but it's not keeping pace with online activity. It's definitely a shift. Uh, we're overbuilt, so if you compare the U.S. to other parts of the world, we have way too much retail. And you've been watching as you see bankruptcies, uh, malls shrinking, a lot of things going on, and some of that contraction has been compensating for uh, parts of our state and country that are just over retail relative to what we see in other parts of the world. Yes? So am I remembering right uh, with the transition that there was the Target tried to uh, move into Canada? <coughs> They, I think they opened like 200 stores, and like two years later, they pulled out of Canada because they just could, <coughs> excuse me, they just could not compete. And I see here Canada per capita has a lot fewer stores than mm -hmm. the um, yeah. United States. We have a, a national economy that's built on consumption or consumerism, largely. And so it's tied into what we see out there in terms of bricks and mortar and, and square footage. And, and it's, we're going through a season now where it's recalibrating. And where it's overbuilt, it's being repurposed for reuse. Or, and it might not be that the square footage shrinks, but those buildings are being used differently. And they're not generating the same revenue that they used to in their traditional model. But the experiential sort of dynamic is still alive and well. If you're talking mm -hmm. about, you know, a wine tasting boutique or a restaurant or a creamery or a coffee house. Whatever. Yeah, there's definitely people want that, and I've, I've got some information in here that supports that reasoning. And so it's not that people don't want to go places, they want to gather, they want to eat, they want to shop, but they're, they're uh, more selective and creative about how and when they do that. So, oh, yes. Yeah, um, some countries tax services as well as products and do, do any of these countries do that and if are those tax dollars included in here or not yeah they uh they do um the, maybe the closer to home example i like to use our california economy from a sales tax perspective uh, because we don't tax services and a number of things we're probably taxing 35 or 40 percent of our gdp at that seven and a quarter percent rate and then more for local taxes Hawaii is a good example where they have a much broader base. They tax about 88% of their GDP, and their tax rate is 4%. So there are examples even within the states where there's a much broader base and a lower rate. And California, frankly, is behind on that conversion or discussion. Um, so I want to mention this order desk issue. So um, all the convenience of delivery we get is having a smaller number of communities 
building out a lot of fulfillment and distribution centers, particularly along transportation corridors in the Central Valley, Inland Empire, near airports. And so the way the sales tax law works today, those order desks, where they're located is where the sales tax flows. So there tend to be smaller number of agencies generating a lot more revenue. So out of our database, the chart on the left is looking at fulfillment centers and how the revenue has been growing from those statewide uh, over the last um, few years. And then conversely, uh, looking at department stores as a category. So this would be your Macy's, Kohl's, Sears, that crowd, uh, correspondingly dropping. And so there's um, a heavier concentration of tax revenue going into a fewer number of agencies in California. Next, um, you can't get away from the uh, emergence of digital devices and how that's influencing how people shop. You've probably seen people standing in stores with their smartphone, looking at the shelf price, looking at something in their hand, and making decisions. All of that is influencing what's happening in retail. Uh, Amazon, I like to characterize them as world dominators. I don't think there's anything they don't think they can take on, including uh, delivery systems like UPS and FedEx. And they, they are uh, helping disrupt, and I mean that in a positive way, but a lot of shift in retail. So we're not needing clerks, we're needing uh, warehouse people and technicians that understand how to work in a facility like you see in the top slide the picture. A lot of technology investment, artificial intelligence is going to influence this. So we have to think through, like, if you're talking uh, into one of your devices at home and ordering things, we have to start thinking about where does that end user transaction, where do those tax dollars flow? And it's just a reminder again that we have an antiquated system that's not keeping up with the way we are buying and consuming things. Uh, I mentioned, uh, I think, the Wayfair decision, and so that's going to start April 1st. Uh, there's some legislative discussion going on about should the exemption levels remain that they were in South Dakota, which was $100,000 a year <coughs> annually of, of, trans, of value or 200 transactions that exempts a taxpayer from complying. But there's talk about raising the exemption. So that's not necessarily, that's working at odds with trying to grow the tax base uh, statewide. And then I think lastly, I would just tell you that the biggest challenge, or big, yeah, the biggest one is what you just were hitting at, Mayor, is we've got a service economy, a high rate, we aren't taxing much, and something needs to change. Um, that's why the rates keep getting higher, because what we're able to tax keeps shrinking. So amid, in all that, I want to just give you some, some things to think about, some opportunities. As you, as you deal with um, the challenges you have today and into the future. So uh, brick and mortars are going away. People want to show up. They want experiences. They're interested in stores that are unique. Uh, there are trends going on in uh, specialty stores around beauty products, uh, breweries, uh, boutique wineries, all kinds of things that people are interested in and want to have experiences. So they'll come out and show up. Uh, it's done on smaller footprints, typically. It's not done on the grand mall stage anymore. It's it's different. Uh, main streets where you have them or you can reinvigorate them or create them are very uh, appealing to people. It creates a lot of uh, really good downtown synergy and energy. And industry, like, we like to say industry is a new retail. So a lot of this trending that's going on uh, around industry has to be paid attention to. So things that you might, you might yes, could you, um, could you expand a little bit on the industry as a new retail? I sure. fully understand that. Well, I was going to go through a little bit of it. So let me see if, if I hit on it. And if not, I'll be glad to circle back and, and address your question. So um, just some elements I think the, the council might want to consider as you're thinking about uh, sales tax and, and what it means for your future. Having some really good understanding of your trade areas, the demographics underneath that, um, income levels, education, market trends, or you've got surpluses, meaning you might have a, uh, an overabundance per capita of a particular kind of use, or where you have gaps, where you have room to, to fill some of that. And then really understanding what, what your community desires and what your community is willing to support. Question? Yes. I, I know you provide services to the, the city on an ongoing basis in terms of sharing sales tax dollars. Do you ever share with us the, what you just described as gap analysis or gaps or, or surpluses that would 
help us? Do we already have information that would help us at least identify yeah. what, what we're not getting that most cities would get? There's a couple levels to that um, sharing of information. So the more uh, standard one, we break all of your eight groups into business types. So we can look at quick service restaurants, building materials, new auto dealers, and we can run um, a very simple bar chart that's done on a per capita basis and can show you where you have surplus and where you have gap. And so I think your staff has seen that over time. Uh, doesn't give away, typically doesn't give it away anything that's confidential. We have confidentiality requirements under sales tax law. Um, there are some communities that will go through a more sophisticated approach to understanding that, and so we have a, a separate group uh, that does specific work on market trends and demographics and tries to help you. Uh, I'm thinking of a client I'm, I'm just helping them work with where they wanted a real understanding of who's buying in their community. So there's a lot of resident versus non-resident kind of information to understand where your tax dollars are coming from or where they're flowing to. And so that's another level of detail that, that can be provided, but that's it's kind of above our basic um, scope. So secondly, um, from a retailer perspective, you know, understanding uh, people that want to come here and be here and invest in your community, what are the things that they're looking at through a developer or business owner lens, building size, parking, all those kind of things, densities, uh, and, and they're looking at tenant mix. There's a lot of synergy around certain tenants like to be with other tenants. And they have figured that out over time, and they know that those are successful, so they try to do that together. Third, I would suggest that there's got to be uh, figuring out a tenant mix has to have some kind of a vision and a strategy about it and a way to communicate that um, in broadening these industrial business uses. And when I say industrial uses, there's a lot of kind of quiet sales tax generation that comes through, and you have some of that here in, in your community that isn't the retail center, but you've got people selling office equipment, med biotech equipment, energy utilities, uh, a variety of things that we would consider kind of business to business transactions that are also tax generating, they're good job generating, and, and it's important, I think, to think through where those might be appropriate or where they can be integrated into your community um, alongside more traditional, more traditional retail. And then lastly, uh, just suggesting that, you know, it's really still a personal relationship business, so knowing your brokers and your business community and all those folks, the lending institutions, is really helpful in terms of trying to succeed. So I'm going to close uh, with just this bottom line. Uh, if, if things don't change, uh, sales tax is going to continue to grow, and it's even going to go through cycles where we hit a slowdown. I don't think we're going to see a recession like we did 10 years ago, but at some point, recovery will stop. Uh, economic development is going to require some fairly sophisticated work at the local level. Uh, and then uh, our company looks at, you know, we do a lot of work all over the state and we've in various ways been part of statewide committees and league, league participation, et cetera, about changing the way sales tax is, you know, structured and applied and it needs to, it needs to broaden and it probably needs to go to a point where it's more of a destination model or a delivery model and less of what is kind of stacked up in the traditional uh, brick and mortar allocation. So that is my presentation. That's a, a map, uh, that's a heat map, I guess, of tax rates all over the United States. So surprisingly, there's some higher rates in places like New Mexico and stuff that sometimes are surprising to people because we don't think that way. So I'm glad to answer any more questions of council. Questions, Council? Vice Mayor. Well, I, I thought that was an excellent presentation. I think you, um, you touched on some things that um, will make us think. And I think it, it's a jumping off place, really, maybe for us to fashion our model, our, um, and we're going to deal with it maybe a little bit later in terms of how we approach uh, our facing our revenue gaps and so forth, because um, it's all important. I mean, this is, um, these trends, I mean, um, I think everybody's known, we've, you know, um, the, the mayor, the, the past mayor, I've written about it in newspapers about, you know, the um, Amazon effect, Amazon Prime, I mean, you just, you know, you have your phone, 
and 13 hours later you have your product. So that's good, but it, it, it has its problems. So um, I think this is a really good food for thought for us, uh, how we fashion our, um, uh, our policies moving forward. So thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Council Member Tim? Yeah, I just had a question on the order desk fulfillment center model that's happening. You said that's happening in the, the valley areas. Um, More so. Yeah. yeah. So is that something that we could tap into here, or are we, or is that going to be challenging because of, I don't know, based on your analysis, what do you see there? Yeah, I mean, where, where they, well, they tend to do things on a much larger scale, you know, so it's not a common to see a million or two million square feet, so you need to turn it around the state. But there are uh, examples where uh, it's getting closer into people and there's smaller footprints, but there's still a demand for transportation orders. And we have to think of the impacts of trucks and other things and where would that be placed. I would suggest that any community ought to be open to thinking through where some of that could occur appropriately within your community because if we're still operating under the same rules, absent it kind of filling in here on the Central Coast or something, it's going to it's going to stay out there and, and just come this way via trucks. So, but but that filling figuring out that last mile that's kind of the new cliche of you know how do you get there quicker or faster? I mean, businesses are certainly open to that, particularly for products that are commonly shipped. Right. Councilman Reed. Thank you, Mayor. And first of all, Mayor, I apologize to you and the council and to the public for being late. I, I conveyed earlier I had a work commitment that was going to keep me late, and I recorded this meeting, and I'm going to watch the part that I missed when I got home. So apologies for that. Um, following up um, Councilmember Tim's point about uh, distribution centers, and, and it does seem like the, the big players in the space are looking for square feet in the millions, so you got to have a lot of dirt to begin with. But then isn't the downside, um, even if you do have the dirt, and you want to proceed with that, there could only be 80 jobs tied up in that million square yeah, feet of the warehouse. Yeah, you're absolutely right because a lot of it is driven by technology. So yeah. most of those centers, uh, the local jurisdiction gets a fairly nice kind of one-time pop for the robotics related equipment and things that go into those buildings, but it's, it's not a lot of jobs and it's not typically a lot of well-paying or high-paying jobs. So um, there are other reasons for having that there, but that is not, per se, one of them, so. And then, um, I looked over your presentation earlier today, uh, and I agree with everything uh, Vice Mayor Johnson said, very thorough and, and very valuable. We're grateful that you did this. Um, I know uh, your crystal ball probably isn't better than anybody else's up here at the same time. Uh, do you have a perspective on, you know, we've heard a lot of things potentially coming in Sacramento, changes to Prop 13, split role, um, one of the things that's talked about is, is extending uh, sales tax to service. Any uh, feel for the likelihood of, of some of those scenarios that could have a, a significant change on how localities realize revenue in the next yeah. two years? Uh, so in my former life, I spent 26 years in city government and watched a number of these studies trying to figure out how does sales tax get modernized. They came from state commissions, they came from the League of Cities, and what's difficult is when you're trying to split up a pie and you're changing the rules, you end up in a win-lose scenario. Yeah. So not to be pessimistic, but it's difficult unless there's some way to kind of hold harmless those that end up negative. But having said that, uh, our company and I sat in uh, with some, a group of 30 city managers over the last year through the League of Cities. Uh, we were providing a lot of the data, uh, trying to help them figure out uh, State Constitutional Amendment 20 was sponsored by Senator Glazer and his idea is we should just move everything to destination. Get rid of these old rules, everything goes to where it's delivered. Uh, and you can study that and realize quickly it's good for bedroom communities, it's going to be tough for these agencies that have big fulfillment centers or places like Sand City which have very little retail, very low population, right? So, um, so that uh, Constitutional amendment died in the Appropriations Committee, but I'm pretty confident it's going to come back. I know the governor, we've got a new governor of legislature that's interested in seeing a lot of things getting done, so it wouldn't surprise me that some types of reform will be part of the legislative discussion, but I can't tell you exactly what it's going to look like. That, that was AB20, the Glazer Bill? Or the uh, SB, right? It was, it was, was SCA20. It started out, I think it was Assembly Bill 1466, but... okay. Uh, 
part of the history lesson on sales tax, if you've been around local government long enough, when the state kept raiding money, Prop 1A got passed in 2004 that kind of protects the distribution formulas of sales tax, property tax, and vehicle license fees. So the only way, many people believe the only way those rules could get changed is through a constitutional amendment because that's what locked it in to begin with. And so uh, it's not just a bill, it would have to go out to a vote of Californians in order to change it. So thank you very much again. It's a very helpful presentation. Councilman Owen. And as others have said, it's it's certainly a topic we've been concerned about and watching and appreciate your input and the thoroughness of the report and your background that uh, you've got a great resource, we think, so you mentioned Haryama for bringing you forward. Um, and the thing that, you know, I think we all are hearing about and, and the, the need for the restructuring with the Amazon factor, the online sales, and the other thing is that we have had uh, in the past um, prohibited Airbnbs, even though I did some research and realized we still have them, but we're not collecting any QOT. So this area and some of the things, like I say, the sharing, are areas that we definitely need to take a different look at. And, uh, and uh, that was that point too was was uh, helpful. So thank you. I have a few questions. Yes. Um, first, um, you mentioned I think you said something about the um, our rate being higher and, and we don't tax everything. Is it true that California, if you ignore the states that don't have a sales tax, that we have the, that we tax the fewest items? because we have so many exemptions for medical equipment and, and lots of other things? I, we're definitely way, we're, we're at the high end of the exemption curve and we're taxing less merchandise. I can't say we're number one, mm -hmm. but we're definitely in the maybe top 10 of the 50 states in the US. So we, we definitely have a very narrow base. Uh, and you can look at most states and you're gonna find their taxing services and doing other things. Yeah. Uh, which yeah. makes our rate look artificially high because we're taxing fuel. Yeah, things. so it's just it's just math. We're trying to get the same amount of money out of a smaller pool of stuff so the rates keep going north, right? Um, mm -hmm. Also, I had a question about fulfillment centers. Um, I've heard that in some cities that have attracted large fulfillment centers, that they have very large rebates back to the cities as and basically they strike a deal with, if you will, with the cities to locate there and they'll get a lot of those tax dollars back. Is that true? That is true. They're, uh, not in every circumstance, but in many. Uh, part of the draw, is, and you've got typically a lot of infrastructure to build around those facilities, so there's a discussion and an agreement that's reached about getting roads built, the other things that are necessary to move the goods around, and, and so some tax rebating is often put together in an agreement that ends up in front of a city council to you know, memorialize that. So, so when that happens on a large scale, that would really deprive all cities of tax dollars collectively. Right, because it's it, that's what I'm saying. It's kind of a concentration of maybe a couple of dozen cities or so across the state, because that's, land is cheap, labor is cheaper, uh, the freeways are there, you know, and so a lot of the coastal area is built out, and so it's, it's more challenging to figure out how to get that in those, in those areas. My last question, um, I'm, I'm rusty on the rule, but there's a $5 million rule that might relate to construction projects. And as I recall, it has to do with a large, very large building got built in Scotts Valley, that um, there might be out of state um, supplies coming in and equipment, and that the tax dollars, to the extent they come to this county, they would go to the county pool, and Scotts Valley, say it was a Scotts Valley project, Scotts Valley would only get a portion of those tax dollars because population-wise, if that's how it's done, we're just, you know, we're, uh, I don't know, uh, 5% of the county population or something. Um, so question is, is, is that, I understand that you can enter into a voluntary agreement with um, a developer or somebody that's building something yes. and have them send a, a form in to the state which says that all those, those tax dollars will completely go, the 1% anyway, to, um, to the city. And so confirm that for me and then ask me, what we could apply that to, or let me know. For instance, we may be building a town center soon. I would not, even though we're heavily involved in that, would literally be built by a, a developer that would own the land, not us anymore. And so the tax dollars for that, is this a kind of rule that could apply to that because it would be a lot of dollars? Right, uh, it could. Uh, my experience says often it does not. And so I want, let me just, 
you're, you're, you're right about the rules. So there are, within California law, if you've got construction related activity and valued at five million or more, and I'm talking about products that are worth that, so I'm talking about steel and concrete, you know, those kind of things. Not, not the cost of the whole job, which is a lot of labor, but actually the cost of product. Uh, there is a process to um, go through the state, but those developers slash contractors or their subs have got to go get what's called job site construction permits in advance of starting the work. It's the only way the state will allow the money to be directly reported back to a local community. So it takes a fair <coughs> amount of front end work and coordination. Uh, often those are tied into agreements because maybe you've got other things in your agreement and this is a piece of what's in that agreement. So a developer in the agreement, for instance, up to Yeah, that, that's one way to go about that. Um, it still doesn't compel them to do it, so it's a question of working with probably with your city attorney and others to figure out how do you try to make that as tight as you can because it's still voluntary. You can't compel them, but typically what I see is there's kind of a minimum return uh, related to sales taxes put in those agreements, and so it's advantageous to them to try to do it through the system I just described, or the, the fallback is they're just writing you a check in some other way. But, mm -hmm. And, and I do want to be clear, the pools are distributed based upon Scotts Valley's share of sales tax relative to all the other agencies in the county. It's not a per capita, and so it's your base measured against all the other cities in the county unincorporated area. That's how the pool is distributed. Okay. But we might, we could see we could be losing 90% of something. <clears throat> oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I mentioned earlier on the equipment piece, the half million, that's even more common because the threshold is lower. And so we find often uh, you've got projects, maybe you've got a medical facility here that's buying an imaging machine that would be eligible for direct reporting. And so those are the things we try to track and monitor on the city's behalf to make sure that that comes back locally where it's appropriate. So you watch out for that yeah, uh, as you give us the reports. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Here? Yes. And some, a couple things you said made me think of the industry that we, you know, Scotts Valley was one of the first areas where high tech started, and um, but it at that time didn't generate as the sales tax that you might think. Um, and I know you're addressing some of those changes, but even something like we, we several of us were at the ribbon cutting for uh, Dumtel Genomics. It's a nationwide company, and. Uh, I remember it being there at the time, wondering how that might support services and, and thinking about the past being industry, not those tax dollars not staying here. So it sounds like there's some changes and some things that may help in that area, but I'm not as clear on what that might be. Well, we're, we're just working with the rules that the state has you know, implemented and adopted over time. So a business like that, uh, always uh, thoughtful discussions with them of understanding their, their business model, where do they order, where do they ship from, and your staff have information that you know can help you from a policy making perspective, kind of know, you know, what what can they do, and so you can't again you can't typically unless you've got some form of agreement you can't bind them to something, but if you understand how that works and who you're seeking uh, and how they're operating their business, I mean first of all they've got to be selling something that's taxable. Right? Mm -hmm. So sometimes that's just not the case. They're selling more services than they are product. Uh, and so you don't see a lot of revenue. But to the extent they are creating or manufacturing something, where is that order desk and where is that product being shipped from are the two really big questions to understand where the taxes are going. Other questions from council? Is there anyone in the public that would like to? Uh, to uh, Weigh in on this subject. Yes, in back first. Uh, would you like? Would you mind uh, some another speaker comes in? Thank you. Oh, sure. Yes, won't you come to the front, please? Uh, yes, I, I do have a couple of questions. Yeah, would you come to the podium, please, so we can hear you? Thank you. Um, our, our community, Santa Cruz County, is a, a very unique community. 
in that um, our department stores don't do very well here. Case in point, Sears is going out of business and Macy's seems like they're constantly sending the sales of sales. Um, people in this community in retail tend to like to support the small retailers. Um, I certainly do. And, um, you know, particularly with pet supplies, I make it a point to go to the local people in Scotts Valley versus the big box stores. I want to see these people stay in business. They're part of our community. It's um, more of an emotional. It's not really probably a fiscal thought, but it is for the individual business owners. Um, the other thing is, I am from the Southwest originally, New Mexico, and we have sales tax on everything. Doctors, anything you buy, any service, you have your heater looked at, there's a sales tax. But I want to say, property taxes are extremely low there and mortgages are considerably lower than here. So you have to look at everything in balance. We pay very high mortgages, we pay very high property tax, and we pay very high retail tax, nine point something percent, depending on our community, our own city. And I think we need to look at that. How much more retail tax could we pay if it was local? I know they want to um, we're talking about putting warehouses in, and what would be the aesthetics of putting warehouses in Santa Cruz County? We do have a number of them off of Mission Avenue, and um, but it's a different kind of district than Scotts Valley Town or you know Pacific Avenue, Santa Cruz. So I just want people to think about the various aspects of the type of community we are. It's real special. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Reber. Hi, I'm uh, Danny Reber with the Scotts Valley Chamber of Commerce, and I just wanted to make a couple little comments. First off, I just wanted to um, thank you, Ken, for giving such a great um, presentation, and I wanted to thank uh, Jenny Hariyama for reaching out to the Chamber, inviting myself and the board members <coughs> to be here tonight. And, um, just a tiny question I had is I was wondering if this was an available um, a digital copy, and um, if so, if, if it's okay to even share some of these slides with chamber members would be uh, one of my, my small questions. And then just another one more out of curiosity, we're talking about um, industry um, in, some, in some of your graphs up there, and I'm curious, we have some a lot of manufacturing in Scotts Valley, like businesses like Perfumers Apprentice that do, I think, $150 million international business. We got zero motors, motorcycles, I'm curious, or some of those might fit into that pie, which was just sort of a, one of the little questions. But anyway, those are my only only small questions. And yeah, thank you again for um, the presentation. Very nice. Uh, so would you like me to stand up here? Okay. Yes, please. Uh, so, so to your first question, everything that uh, was presented tonight is public. So however you want to get this through city staff or whatever, I mean, have at it. So there's nothing in there that... It's currently online. Okay, there you go. Uh, I think uh, those businesses that you mentioned, and there's probably others, um, the best way to, to really know if there's any potential for, uh, well, some of those may be generating sales tax. But, you know, we'd have to look at that specifically, and there's always there confidentiality around that uh, under state law. Uh, but the, the staff um, are aware of that and, and probably could help navigate that. But absent, uh, well, I guess with the confidentiality issue noted, um, Certainly going out and talking to those businesses and just understanding how they, what, what they're doing in those locations and how it's really an ordering and transaction. It's kind of where does a contract get signed, where does the order get fulfilled, and where does the product get shipped from? Those are the real questions that are dictating whether the revenue stays local or whether it's going in a pool or whether it's going somewhere else. So it could be they had a fulfillment center in Tracy making that up and had an order desk in Ohio, it could be that the dollars are going back to Tracy even if you've got R&D or a bunch of people working here in that kind of an industry because it's not linked into the right way of structuring in order to keep the tax level. It does vary. It's very business to business for sure. 
and of course there are motorcycles, I believe, also has a Santa Cruz location. So you know, I don't know how that might play into it, but right. that's even way more. Yeah, there, and, and you have to even look at sales tax different than your local measure use. So when, if, even if they were doing work here, you could get the sales tax if they're shipping most of it out. That's money that's going to end up in other jurisdictions. It doesn't stay here. So, and the reverse is true. So things come in to Scotts Valley, things go out of Scotts Valley. So. Thanks. Yeah. Did anyone else in the audience uh, want to make a comment? Seeing none. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation and very informational. We'll move on to item two, adopt resolutions establishing project specific subcommittees. All right, Mailer, I'll go ahead and take the staff report. Uh, as you know, at our last meeting, the council approved their interjurisdictional appointments, and part of the direction at that meeting was to return with resolutions to establish project-specific council subcommittees. Uh, there were two in particular. One was a budget subcommittee. The other was a council library facilities upgrade committee. Those resolutions are attached for your information. Uh, just very briefly, the budget subcommittee um, shall be effective if council chooses to establish it this evening um, from today through the end of the calendar year. And it's a, a undetermined um, how much work we will continue to do on areas related to the FSP uh, and the budget. So I just um, took the liberty of making that recommendation for you for your consideration. Uh, it would be comprised of the mayor and vice mayor per the council's direction. And um, as I mentioned, it would include um, recommendations and guidance with respect to the development of the 1920 budget and also um, the update of the city's fiscal sustainability plan related to implementation strategies and the framework for the informational campaign um, to enhance the community's awareness of our fiscal outlook. Um, the other is the facilities upgrade subcommittee with respect to the library. The same duration is recommended. Um, as you know, this item will be coming before you on March 6th for further discussion. So we'll see where that leads us. And the representation um, on this committee is Vice Mayor Randy Johnson and Council Member Jim Reed. And um, I won't go through at length um, the bullets before you in the staff report, but the council was very specific of what the task was with the subcommittee um, last year when they uh, directed the subcommittee to work on how to identify future capital needs as it relates to the library in the context of Measure S and working on a market feasibility study and looking at costs for a preliminary um, performing arts use uh, and flexible space. And then obviously the subcommittee would make recommendations with respect to the project and the funding. And so um, that's it in a nutshell. Again, um, you have um, options to take uh, liberties to approve resolution number 1959 and 1959.1. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, City Manager Harriam. Questions from Council? I have a couple. Um, first, these are the only are these the only two project specific subcommittees at this point would be? These are the only two that Council directed. A council can establish project specific subcommittees at any time. Okay. Thank you. And then my other question um, looks like these are would be in place, we say, until December thirty first. And so my question is, uh, if there's still a need come December thirty first of uh, what do we do at that point? So each year you establish subcommittees, so you would just go ahead and reestablish them for the subsequent year when your appointments come before you again. And so if it were the, for the same purpose uh, with a different timeline, would that continue to qualify as, a, uh, uh, as an ad hoc committee? I'll let the attorney answer that. It may or may not. It depends on, on what work is left to be done. So um, in December, we can visit those issues. I would imagine by that time, some of the um, issues that you may be looking at may change. And so as long as there is some variation in the duties of the subcommittee, we could create a, a new ad hoc subcommittee. Okay. And knowing that we normally um weigh in on subcommittee appointments uh, in January, after December 31st. Um, I guess what happens on December 31st um, when this expires, do we have some latitude to continue in case we had to meet in early um, 2020? Would we still have the ability to do that or would we have to wait until the council actually acts? You would have to act. Okay. Either before December 31st or we would have a little gap there. If that were the case. 
Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Kirsten, uh, City Attorney Powell, um, I know there are some folks have different interpretations of ad hocs and what uh, public noticing requirements are allowed, uh, public, uh, the rules for uh, accessibility by the public are different for standing committees and ad hocs. Are you comfortable that the interpretation that we use here and the regularity with which these two um, uh, temporary committees would meet are, are going to keep us well on the side of something that's that's defensible and within generally accepted practice in, in California municipal law? Yes. It's not the regularity with which they meet, it's the duration of time that they're in existence. So um, that's why we've limited this time period for approximately 10 months. Um, if you needed to meet every week for 10 months, that's okay. It's the period of time that the okay. subcommittee exists. Thank you. Any other comments? Uh, any comments from the audience? Okay. Seeing none. Um, Mayor, I would yes. move, um, if you're ready for a motion. Yes. Yes. I would move um, uh, resolution 1959, uh, creation of a uh, budget subcommittee, and also move uh, resolution 1959.1, the creation of a library facilities upgrade subcommittee, and uh, waive the reading thereof. I'll second that. Um, question, is it okay to lump these two resolutions together into one motion? Two resolutions, so two motions. Two motions, yes. okay. Uh, we'll take, well, we, I can, we did have a motion and second on each, so we'll take the first one, uh, resolution 1959. Uh, any further comment? Seeing none, um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Seeing none, uh, pat, motion passed unanimously. And then we'll take resolution number 1959.1, previously moved and seconded. Um, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Move on to item three. A public hearing to consider a planned sign program for two new commercial buildings located at 260 Mount Hermon Road, APMs 022-231-27 and-28. Development Director of Payment. Okay, thank you. Um, as you guys may recall, on March 21st of 2018, the City Council approved the Hangar Commercial Development Project located at 26 Mount Hermon Road. Um, just to give you a little refresher, that project um, consists of a 2,500 square foot uh, drive through restaurant. It's going to be occupied by Starbucks. It also included a 13,000 square foot commercial building, which would include retail space and a restaurant use. So on the slide here in front of us, we have um, in the bottom left corner the uh, Starbucks building along Mount Hermon Road, and then in the bottom right corner we have the hangar building. It's a, that's a side view, and then we have an aerial view above which is flipped, so you can see both those buildings there. Um, the proposal tonight, um, just to give you a little bit of a background, it's for um, a plan sign program, and it consists of a freestanding identification sign for the commercial center, and then it also includes tenant identification signs for the hangar building, and it also includes a third component, which is tenant identification signs for the Starbucks building. Um, as you may recall, the proposed project is located in the Scotts Valley Town Center specific plan area, and these um, guidelines that are in place um, encourage the preparation of a planned sign program for um, commercial businesses there. And in particular, a planned sign program is, um, the purpose of it is to facilitate the creation of a thorough and integrated signing system that encourages high quality sign designs, which enhance the uh, character and value of the community. So just diving a little bit deeper into the actual um, program itself, um, here we see an aerial view of the freestanding sign along Mount Herman Road. In the top right corner is the sign and it's just showing the proximity to Mount Herman Road there. So basically it's a, a, announcing that the center is here. Um, this next sign um, delves into a little bit more detail what the actual freestanding sign will look like. It has a gray and black stone and metal style, and it blends with the existing architecture of the Starbucks and the hangar, which are located to the rear there. Um, the main portion of the sign is approximately 13 feet in height. The column that announces the hangar there, that's approximately 15 feet in height. Um, the, as far as the materials, the center identification portion of the sign would utilize internally, internally admit metal box letters. So you see that, that's the hanger there. 
and then the tenant identification signs will be black metal letters and they'll be located on metal panels. And the tenant signs will be illuminated with ground mounted lighting. So the hangar sign will be illuminated internally and there'll be uh, a mix of lighting that will shine on the tenant identification there. Um, <clears throat> while reviewing this, one of the things that um, we, we kind of fell back on was looking at the um, town center specific uh, plan guidelines. And basically what that does is it establishes a framework for the development that establishes uh, looking to sense, establish a sense of place and a destination for the city of Scotts Valley. And so while we were reviewing this, we, we, this is basically one of the first buildings to go into our future town center. And so we explore the opportunity of putting some signage on this freestanding sign that identified the Scotts Valley Town Center. Um, there's a project condition in here right now that requires that. Um, conversations with the developer um, who's in the audience tonight, they have gone ahead and put forward a proposal. It's not on this slide, but I'll show you at the end. So there's going to be some text in there announcing the, the, this is a part of the Scotts Valley Town Center. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. I don't have it on this slide, but just wanted to let you know that that's um, in the proposal here for you tonight as well. So moving um, through here a little bit, these are some different views of it. You can see the stone at the bottom, the metal, and the uh, column elements as well, a little more detail. Uh, put a, There's a person in there for a little bit of perspective on the size. Again, just another um, variation on that. Um, so the next component of this is the wall signs for the actual hangar building. And what we see there, there's going to be individual box letter signs and logos that are proposed to identify the hangar building, and then also the tenants that are going to be within that building. And um, briefly, the signs will be constructed in uh, black metal with translucent faces that are internally illuminated. Uh, the size and locations of the signs will vary on the tenant mix. So this is a sign program that allows for flexibility for future tenants out there. Um, this plan here specifies you know, the types of locations, the size, the materials, has a lot of detail in there that will be implemented over time as tenants occupy that space. Um, so that's that. There's a few more. You get a little bit of a sense of the, uh, the signage that will occur there. There's a mix, uh, but, but also a similar theme running throughout that as well. So moving on to the next component of the plan sign program is the um, wall and directional signs for the Starbucks facility. So this is the commercial building that is located um, up near Mount Hermon Road. It consists of uh, wall-mounted signs on the side of the building, logo signs on the front and rear, and then there's also yeah, a number of directional signs and menu boards for the drive-through portion of the restaurant. So, Essentially what you're going to see on that building, there's going to be internally illuminated, uh, white face lit, single line channel letters. Um, that came out very smoothly. Um, <laughs> our, and they're proposed for the size of the building. So that will be uh, this component right here at the bottom. You see the word Starbucks there. And then um, we also see on the front of the building, uh, the top of the picture here, the Star standard Starbucks logo that we see uh, the world over essentially, I guess. And um, this is the other elevation skin too. So on both sides of the building, you see the Starbucks lettering, and then you see the logo on the front and back of the building. Um, one thing that staff identified while reviewing the application was the um, letter sizing for the Starbucks. They're currently 18 inch tall letters, and uh, we put in the staff report just a little brief mention of maybe possibly considering 12 inch lettering, which would uh, reduce the size of the sign and would um, maybe, you know, maybe be a little more proportional to the building. We've discussed that with the developer and um, the folks at Starbucks, they feel as though the 18 inch is more suitable to their needs, but it's just out there for a design uh, consideration for the city council. I don't think it's a big deal one way or another, but it's just something to consider. Um, so with that, Tracy, could you bring up the other slide? I wanna just go back to the town center branding and the concept there. So this is the... Um, revised slides here, so we'll go straight to this one. So you can see on this one, we now have at the base the word Scotts Valley Town Center. So what we're trying to, again, is create that brand, that identity, that sense of place that the Town Center specific plan calls for. Um, and this is, will be in uh, basically their metal letters that are pin mounted and they're halo lit. And so it's a, it's a kind of a unique sign, but it will stand out during the day as well, but also at night too. Um, we have a condition in there that this be put in there 
Um, one of the things is that while this is a very nice look, we don't quite know what the shape and uh, look of the town center is going to be. So we may want to have some flexibility. Um, you know, the council can certainly approve this, but maybe we make sure that there's some flexibility that we can alter that or change that in conjunction with the property owner, depending on the final you know, plan that we see with the town center. Um, the town center, I, there's a bit of a timing issue there, and I, you know, ultimately we may have to put this up before the town center is approved but we want to maybe have some flexibility in the interim time until the sign actually goes up. This sign's probably maybe nine months away from being installed. Would that be a fair assessment? So there's a bit of a timing thing there that we want to just be able to leave the options open to, to uh, staff, developer, uh, as we move forward here. So that's the um, component that I wanted to talk to you guys about. So with that, staff is recommending approval of the plan sign program. and. Um, Available for questions. We also have Corbett Wright, the project developer, here for questions as well. Vice Mayor. So, um, what caught my attention? You recommended 12 inch letters versus 18. What motivated you to make that recommendation? Um, sometimes, when you look at the size and the mass of the building, sometimes proportionally um, it can make the building look a little smaller by putting a bigger sign on it. By making the sign smaller, the building will look a little bigger and have a little more presence. Um, one of the other things, I've just been looking at other Starbucks in the community. The um, Starbucks that's down on Ocean Street, they have um, lettering on there, and that they're utilizing a 12-inch lettering on that building. Um, it almost looks like it might be a little bit too small because that's a very big building. Uh, but also that, um, as was pointed out by the developer, they also utilize the words Starbucks coffee there. So they actually have more signage there too. So this is actually in some ways less wording so it's, it's just something that kind of came up in the review process. I don't know if it really makes that much of a difference, but I just wanted to have that out there as a, as a design consideration. Other questions from council? Maybe to follow up on the vice mayor's uh, question there, and, um, does the applicant have a perspective on 12 versus or 18? Yeah. And, and, and I don't, vice mayor, I don't want to, uh, it's not the time for him to come up. But well, okay. yeah. Well, we want you to get up here, get you up here, but hold on one minute. So, well, and, let's and, ask our questions. So, I would be, I'd be very interested in, in uh, the applicant's perspective. So, first of all, I mean, if you look at what um, Mr. Wright has put together in his other commercial shopping centers, I mean, you see the type of, you know, quality, you know, stonework and and other materials that are put into this. So, it, yes, it'll be big. Uh, at the same time, it's going to look nice because uh, Corbett puts a lot of emphasis on, on quality signage, as you can see from other projects. But, you know, the, 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 the thought on whether you'd want to have a little bit larger lettering here, you know, there's an argument. We've, we made a point at the Town Center Subcommittee of, of telling the developers, show us plans that show the town green being right in front of the hangar. Make the hangar a vital part of, uh, of the public and retail space that you're trying to create. And when you're, when you're looking to create that retail vibe, you know, there's larger signage that isn't appropriate most other places can really fit well there. Because you want to create an ambiance of this is where there's activity, things are happening, things are big and bright, things are maybe a little bit in your face but in a tasteful way. Um, and I've seen in some of the study mission trips that I've done over the hill um, to some other cities, they they make a real point out of in their their highest commercial districts, they want they want signs that cover two or three story buildings, right? They want big and bold, and, and obviously we're not a place that's that's going to be like downtown Denver or downtown LA or anything like that. At the same time. I think the, the vice mayor's question is uh, is one that's worth considering not only on this project but in the in the town center if there's this could be an opportunity for maybe a little bit more than we were looking at elsewhere. Other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, I I, uh, I tend to agree that you want your tenants to succeed, and the signage is critical to that, and this is going to be your your pass through thoroughfare for that. Um, I'm, only, I'm I may actually be concerned that the the small signage to get people to the back may not be large enough because that that building is going to be tucked back and if we imagine large buildings that are built uh, up front against the road I do have concerns about down the road whether people are going to know what's in the back and what's going to draw them in I'm I'm also just a little concerned about I don't know what the timing is for the town uh, town uh, Scotts Valley Town Center 
labeling on there, and if that if, is it, is that something that's going to come later or go now? Um, you know, we didn't. Again, it was a project condition at the last minute. The developers put forward a proposal for us here. It's something that we could definitely. Um, again, this sign isn't going to be installed probably for another six to nine months. Is that correct? And so, near, you know, the building will go first, and then this will come along somewhere in the face. So we have some time to think about that and play with that if we would like um, as to what that actually might look like. Other questions, in case? No, then Mr. Wright, please uh, come on up. Uh, thank you, staff. It was um, it, signage is incredibly important, and we actually learned um, on the um, Scotts Valley Corners project that we built how what not to do because we had to amend that twice, and so what we tried to do is is not have to come back again. So as we have tenants in a multi-tenant situation that change over time, what we tried to do was <clears throat> stick within a specific architectural type of genre that they have to stick to, but then allow staff to have enough flexibility so that everything doesn't have to come back to, to in this case, council, but uh, planning commission. So when we looked at the massing of this building, I actually went over and measured um, like other uh, other signage around. The biggest one is the Safeway signage, which is directly across the street. It's set back about the same amount um, as ours is set back because we have the meandering sidewalk. And <clears throat> this is actually um, smaller than that is. We didn't think that it was appropriate to have it as big as what the Safeway was just because of the, si uh, the uh, style of the sign itself. So it didn't work quite well as with that. The other thing is that the Safeway is actually set the signage is set up on a mound, so it's actually higher artificially because of that. Um, <clears throat> so I don't have a problem, and actually I, this is part of the town center, and so we, I, as soon as I got the staff report and had the comment back, uh, we added the two things, <clears throat> the, the uh, address uh, on, on the sign at the top, <clears throat> and then also the Scottsville Town Center, and. I don't have a problem if we want to work with, we've, I, I feel, done a great job working with the, the neighboring developers, um, infrastructure extending to them, etc., across our site, working with them, um, and it's been a great relationship, personally, um, and <laughs> at least I think so. And um, so if they wanted to do a different font, or if they wanted to do a different material, we can get together with them. Um, I've sent them our plans, and they like everything that we've done, etc. I also communicated with um, uh, the Prats on the other side. Um, I'll come back to that in just a second. Um, the way that we differentiated, I, I looked at with, with our architect trying to put Scotts Valley Town Center, I wanted to put it at the top originally, but the problem is it's a double-sided sign, and so you can't do box lettering double-sided because from one way it's, it's reversed. and so. We tried to do it with the board and do double-sided on that, and it just looked weird. It did. I mean, I put it at the top first. So we put it at the bottom on, on the stone, which is this, and I'll point out, it's the same materials that are on the Starbucks building. Um, so that stone is the same stone. The standing metal seam on the hanger is the same. The, the only thing that's not the same is the beams, because there are no beams on the front building, but there are on the back on the, on the hangar, so that's the same. And it kind of ties the entire development together that way. I think our architect did a great job. But the, the point that I wanted to differentiate the Scott, and make the Scotts Valley Town Center part pop was to do the halo effect, and I want to show you just how that works. Um, This is a, and a, it's a halo effect. What you do is you stick the metal, uh, the metal individual letters on pins out farther, and then do LED lighting behind it. And that's the only halo effect portion that would be on the sign. So what it does is it, visually, it makes that pop out. I couldn't really make it any larger because it, 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 there's so many letters. It doesn't really fit any other way. So I wanted to put that out. Um, we did uh, meet with the Prats. We have, especially for the Starbucks, but all the directional signage, we added additional directional signage. The point was that to encourage um, uh, the flow of the drive-through, we've studied, okay, what works, what doesn't work. 
And so what we did is we actually added additional uh, directional arrows and then coming from, we were worried that people are going to try to cut through the Kmart Center to come around to get in um, uh, into the drive through that way. So all of the uh, directional signage shows as best we can. We can't make people try not drive like idiots, but <laughs> what we can do is try to direct the flow and, and teach people that way. So we've done that. Um, I, there was like three changes that uh, Kevin asked us to do, and so we did those, and that's and that's in in this uh, plan that you see. With regard to the Starbucks lettering, the one thing that I wanted to bring up was, and I, I, we did go out and look at the lettering, and we actually thought about this before we put it out. So we did have, um, it, like on Ocean Avenue, they do have the word Starbucks coffee, and that and what happens is it becomes. Our building is actually narrower and longer than what that, that's more cute. And so what happens is it that even at, at 12 inches is over 16 feet long. And so it's really, it's really long on the building itself and it takes up most of the building. So that's actually why um, Superior Signs is here in the audience um, and they build all the signs for uh, Starbucks. And they said, hey, it would look better just to do the word Starbucks versus cutting the coffee. And, and, and cutting the coffee because it, it actually masses on the building better. Um, those then, when you do it just as 12 inch letters, then it doesn't look right just to have Starbucks as because it's not tall enough. The other thing I'd point out, and an example of that is um, like Chubby's right next door. It's a smaller word, and so the letter, those letters are actually two feet tall. So I think that, you know, we think in the massing and scale, we thought two feet was too big. And so that's why we did the 18 inches. And I think it's a good medium. Um, I am here to answer any other questions, and then Superior could ask, ask, answer any other questions as well. Any questions, Council? Yeah, yes, um, Vice Mayor. So I, I tend to agree with the, with, you know, you kind of leave it to the professionals. Uh, in some ways, the size and scope, it, it's almost like a photographer's eye. You know, what, what looks and what works, and the rule of thirds, or whatever, whatever it is. Um, uh, so I think I think 18 inches, if if that's in um, in regards to what the professionals think, I think that's fabulous. Okay, I just kind of uh, what people do all the time. So um, I, I think it's in our interest to kind of go along with with that. And um, in general, I, I think we should be pretty we should be pretty happy with that. It looks uh, pretty darn nice. And I agree. I, I, both things. And when you mentioned the four corners, it was a real reminder of of what we all learned from that. And you know, you've improved on it. But I can look back and think, gosh, you know, maybe we should have had more of a presence because I think that center isn't getting notice as it should. And that's all of our faults from back then, so it's not, not your fault or anyone thinks. I just think we didn't realize the height and the elevation and, and a lot of things that, uh, that we've learned from. So you made that point and it struck home with me um, and I agree we, we can look at other Starbucks, we can look and learn and not recreate the wheel and rely on some experts. So I, but I, I like the, the general plan, so the general design. Thank you. I guess customer. Any thoughts on the uh, <clears throat> so on the letters on the, the channel signs uh, on the hangar sign where it says to be determined? Those are here six inches. Right? Um, is that going to fit the scale and is that going to be enough? Do you think from the road to, to announce to people that there's something in the back? I'm worried that that while it looks nice at that size from kind of this view, I'm worried it may actually be a little um, undersized. But I, I would, maybe we hear from the sign professional on that. I don't know. Yeah, this, so this sign actually was designed by a superior, or not, uh, with Lot C originally. We actually took some of those and mass things off of. And I, I have the same concern that the um, if there was a way to build flexibility into that, I mean, what if we only have two tenants? And so can we use that same square footage and, and spread that massing out? Or what if you have four tenants in the same way? What we tried to do is leave it enough paneling there to make it work, but I would be, I would, I would love the discretion. I think you have a great staff, honestly, and and I think that they 
can look at what we put forth and say, yeah, that meets the intent of what council you know, had there. So any discretion that's in there. But the only thing I would say is that the condition nine, I think it is, is a little strange. It's kind of a agree to agree with the future develop, developer about buildings and signage. And so it it's just kind of a strange, that, that's the only negative that I thought about the entire thing. Um, the only other thing I forgot to mention is that there was actually a mistake on the actual plan set itself. The, the Starbucks board mark is actually 21.75, and I think there's a typo on it, on the original, that said it was more than that. It was 30-something or some wrong calculation. So I did point that The out. building side is 20, it's, it's 21.75. <clears throat> Starbucks word mark. Oh. So it's a, like A1. It had a, on one of the prints, it had an incorrect total square footage. The wow. sizing was wrong, because calculation was wrong. That's all. So I would, I would, I would to, to, in a long way, to answer your question, I would love to have staff be able to have flexibility to approve what is appropriate for the final tenant mix that we determine. So I don't know how we, if you could add that into the questions. We can certainly um, add a condition that the developer work with staff to craft um, appropriate language on the, the plans that are before you, because that's the document that's going to guide the future development. So we'll have built into those plans some sort of flexibility, um, you know, with a maximum number of square footage or something to that effect. And so people in the future, because this is something that will be in place for 10 to 20 years, so we want to make sure that we build in that flexibility, but we also have clarity as well. Um, I have a couple comments. Um, one, I, I really like the sign, the hangar sign, um, and I drove around today and saw how similar it is to the sign across the street, but, but very nice at, at the Safeway. And then I noticed some similarities to some of the uh, the, the building that's uh, the transit center. There's some some similar, I don't know the right word, but slopes or angles. Uh, and so it, to me, it tied those pieces together, and ideally we would know what the rest of the town center is going to look like. And so it could blend in perfectly, and sounds like we're uh, going to be looking at that. But from what we do see, what I see, it looks like it's, it's a nice fit, it's a, it's a pretty sign, so um, I like it. I do have a little different perspective on the Starbucks letters. I would actually, and I, I should point out, I'm not fond of big signs in general. I recognize you need a sign probably of this size to make sure folks can uh, find the hangar, that they know where it is, because you're set back. Um, so I, I see the need for it there, and, and certainly, uh, uh, folks knowing where you are is the lifeblood of, of businesses. Uh, Starbucks I feel a little differently about because it's very obvious it's a Starbucks. So I actually prefer the 12-inch the letters, but I would certainly go with what the majority of the council wants in, in that regard. But that would be that'd be my preference. Any other comments? Yes? Uh, absent any uh, comment, uh, comments, I would like to move resolution 15 or 15. It's a public hearing. Okay. Uh, so you just need to open the public hearing. Oh, oh, thank you. Yes, <laughs> open the public hearing. Uh, is there any from the anyone from the public who would like to speak to us on this topic? Seeing none, I'll close the public hearing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So I would like to move resolution of fifth, 1958, uh, resolution city of Scotts Valley of the City Council of the City of Scotts Valley, approving a plan sign program. The hangar development at 260 Mount Hermon Road, APN 022-231-27, and 022-231-28. With the uh, language uh, that was suggested by the community development director regarding uh, working with the, was that part of the motion intended or not? I think that's embedded in the. So I can give you some language for a modified condition, if you'd like. Yeah. Okay. So it would be um, to condition number four. The material size, location, and design of the improvements shall match the approved plans. However, the tenant identification signs can be modified with the approval of the community development director, provided the same square footage 
and design is utilized. With one addition that we would say that the tenant identification signs on the freestanding sign. So it's because it's not to the building signs. Right. Just right. You know, right? Ask a question. Sure. One second. Is that acceptable to the mayor motion? Okay. So yes. what she said. <laughs> Was there a second? Just a quick question. Go ahead. Um, on the, uh, I, I just feel it may be premature to have Scotts Valley Town Center on that signage while we're just building two buildings right now. And so I, I'd love to see that added down the line when the town center is more fully formed. But I don't know if that's just my concern or if other council members share that. I have the same concern. So the way condition number seven is written is that it just, uh, it basically reads a portion of the freestanding sign shall be used to identify the Scotts Valley Town Center to meet the town center specific plan goal of creating a sense of place and to ensure integration of this project into the Scotts Valley Town Center. So there is no timing mandated there, so it could come at a later date. We probably might want to refine that a little bit more, how that might happen. Um, you definitely want to build your sign with the ability to add that flexibility in there, you may have having the appropriate electrical run in there or how that would work. I don't know, I'm not a sign person, but um, I think that that's definitely, I think we might be getting a little ahead of ourselves with that. I, I, I would agree with that. So to maybe to be revisited in two years or, or whatever? We could um, incorporate seven and nine together. Um, so it would be a portion of the freestanding sign shall be used to identify the Scotts Valley Town Center to meet the town center specific plan goal of creating a sense of place and to ensure integration of this project into the Scotts Valley Town Center. Such identification shall be provided in conjunction with the <coughs> development, in conjunction with the future town center developers to integrate signage and structures as development occurs in the town center core area. So, but what would be the trigger uh, to do that specific trigger to, to make that happen? So in that case, it would be when the core of the town center gets built. Um, there may be circumstances under which you may want it sooner. Yes, yes. Or we may not want it at all. Like maybe have another, we have a signage already for the town center that's adequately covering it, or maybe the developer might want to maybe make sure that, hey, we're part of the town center too. Uh, you know, it could be coming from different sources. I think the flexibility is good and maybe just to make sure that the prerogative of the council and staff or whatever is um, observed. And you know, like I say, maybe uh, maybe two two years, or maybe the timetable is wrong. But it's, it's a little nebulous to say when the when the town center gets going because you don't really know when that is. But um, I just want to make sure that down the road, if we want it, all of a sudden it doesn't become um, doable because. I'm not saying it would, but you know, uh, sometimes things change, and the developer may say, well. I don't think I'm going to put that there or whatever. Um, so. So, or just the language. Is that, of, is that so? So, I, I guess that's okay. I, I mean, I think everybody's pretty much on the same page here. I just want to make sure that, um, you know, it's, it's not nebulous. So, we have, we have, we have a, uh, some language from the city attorney, and I think you've given us some direction to maybe try to find some timing mechanism in there. We'll, we'll probably need to stew on that a little bit, but I'm sure we can find something that allows us to have that, uh, you know, at a certain time. So um, what we could do is just add at the, language, at the end of um, seven, that would be um, to ensure integration of this project into the Scotts Valley Town Center at the appropriate time determined by the, and I would say the community development director, um, the purpose of a sign plan, plan sign program is that it doesn't come back to you for every little thing. Mm -hmm. So that would be at the discretion of the CDD. Could we, we would continue to add the, the language for number nine into the uh, after the You can just keep nine as is. Okay. So we'll fit that language into the motion? In the motion. Your second. Okay. Any other comments? Discussion? Okay. Uh, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to uh, seeing the hangar. Thank you. At the LAFCO meeting this morning, a board, two board members came over and said, is the hangar still moving forward? So when you go to LAFCO at the county building and they're asking, it's a good sign.
We'll move on to item four. Adopt fiscal year 2019-20 council goals. City Manager Maria. All right. Well, thank you, Mayor. Um, as you recall, on January 23rd, the council received a status update of the 19, or excuse me, 18-19 goals and discussed um, potential goals for their 1920 work plan. Uh, for the most part, the goals remained the same, but the implementation action under each goal varied as reflected in the attached uh, work plan that I have for your consideration. Um, I won't go through this in detail, but do want to talk at a high level on what we included and what I heard um, at the last meeting. Uh, clearly, we are going to continue on the path to ensure long-term financial um, stability. And one of the directions from um, Council was to refine the FSP to include alternative budget strategies to address revenue needs. Um, there's a variety of kind of check marks here on things that are to be included, um, but it was very clear that the Council wanted to look at both revenue and expenditure um, strategies that could include uh, service staffing uh, reductions. Um, the other was to update the FSP implementation strategy and community engagement framework. Um, heard that loud and clear that it was very important to use the subcommittee to guide um, the framework as well as the recommended approaches for community engagement. Um, encourage business development and expand uh, the economic base. We talked about facilitating the completion of the general plan. And one um, addition that I added into this was to communicate key changes from the updated plan to our clearly our development of stakeholders. And so um, we'll develop a communications plan um, as we get closer to the end of the general plan discussion. The other is facilitate the development of the town center and other complementary land uses. We talked about um, having me engage additional economic development support, not only to support the town center, but also to look at possible reuses of Kmart, um, looking at the Marriott Extended State Hotel and what's happening there. And in addition, that was added that was not discussed at the last meeting was to take a look at um, putting together a measure as project scope uh, to meet bond proceed expenditure timelines. There are triggers that will happen when you um, are looking at bond issuances. There's another one coming up that we have to uh, put a timeline together. So it's going to be incumbent once we get council direction on March 6th on how to proceed with respect to the Theater Guild and Measure S um, that we move forward on this to meet the necessary timelines. Uh, we have implementation of operational initiatives to enhance city services. Um, as you know, we're working on the strategic technology plan. We'll come back with some recommendations on next steps. Uh, one um, item that council added was to look at opportunities to build organizational capacity and service delivery by looking at our city commissions and committee structures and to see if there's a different way to be more effective with our time um, while uh, getting accomplished various advisory goals. Uh, the other last one is the maintain um, quality of life for residents. I did hear um, the importance of maintaining our investment in parks and recreation and public safety. Of course, we'll continue with the body camera um, purchase and implementation, but more importantly, to really be cognizant of those uh, kind of low-hanging fruit opportunities with respect to facility upgrades. Um, one great example that I think uh, Councilmember Johnson had mentioned was facilitating things like the backstop at Sultanen. And so I'm sure we'll hear about that as a part of next year's CIP. But that's just an example of things that we can continue to do uh, to provide amenities for um, the community. Uh, the other is to continue the facilitation of the Glenwood open space and get those trails done. As you know, the next step is to work on the east side. And so that's already underway. And then the last is um, collaborate with uh, water, fire, and other related agencies to explore grant funding opportunities. This was originally directed at just fire, um, but there was some feedback about, hey, you know what, we have opportunities to work with some other agencies and let's have it be a little bit open. So there is an additional bullet mark there that says explore funding opportunities with Scotts Valley Water District. Um, to one, help them look at underground storage opportunities, and two, to help us find ways that we can leverage our resources collectively to upgrade our wastewater facility treatment plant. So, um, of course, we don't have to limit it to just water, but I think it's important that we keep our eye out for other opportunities as well that might um, include collaboration with other agencies in town. Very high level um, summary, uh, but be happy to hear additional feedback or how you would like this changed or modified. Thank you, City Manager. Um, questions from the Council? Uh, Vice Mayor. Thank you, 
you, Mayor. So I think um, this is a big this is a big ask in terms of what we want to do to be proactive and uh, present not only to the city council but I think to the community at large. There are lots of moving parts and. Um, I want to thank the city manager. I think he did a good job in terms of kind of refining and condensing and clarifying what some of the goals of the city, city council should be because it's not easy uh, to um, distill uh, in a couple of pages of, of you know, what we want to do as a city council to kind of benefit this community. So thank you for that. Uh, there probably are other things out there, but I, I, I just, you know, just wouldn't have it in my heart to add more because uh, I think we have enough on our plate here. So from the standpoint of, of, of you know, uh, the goals and the priorities and uh, the topics of discussion are uh, pretty clear. And I think at the top of the list, I think, you mentioned uh, fiscal sustainability, but at the same time, you know, how do we, on a day-to-day -day basis, improve the lives of our uh, citizens in our community? And to that end, I think this is this uh, represents those tasks that we can do, and um, I think it's uh, incumbent on all of us to kind of see what we can do, be active as council members, and as a uh, city government to see uh, that it happens. So, again, thanks. Um, Councilmember Member Reed. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I uh, agree with uh, Council Member Johnson's perspective. I think this is all, um, there's a lot on here at the same time. There's not a lot that's, um, there are some things that maybe don't involve too much staff time that aren't going to be overly onerous. Um, I would think, but uh, all worth doing uh, in, the, in the coming year, it would seem to me. I just wanted to address, when we uh, kicked this around last week, one of the items we kind of uh, went back and forth on, some of us did, was the, uh, the item about uh, building design standards. And city manager, and the example that I always use on that is parking. You know, we've had situations before where the developer has met our parking requirements, uh, but our staff has said they think the development's under part. Um, and city managers pointed out that's going to be addressed through the, or could be addressed through the general plan process, but there are other elements of that as well. And I know when I brought this up a year or so ago, I used just two examples that, you know, I, I experienced in Sky Park. We've got 18 and a half foot wide garages in Sky Park, and virtually nobody has, no city I know of has standards that um, are anything less than 21 or 22 feet. And, Admittedly, some cars are getting big nowadays, but there are some park, there are some driveways in Sky Park that are so short you can't park a truck in the driveway, um, a pickup truck. So I think there are standards other than just parking that do need to be taken up. At the same time, uh, given that this is going to be a lean and mean year um, uh, until we um, until we get more uh, revenue and have staff resources, I, I am comfortable with that. Uh, dropping off the list on uh, regarding quality of life until we're in a little bit better revenue situation. But I do think that's something we should take up then. Councilmember Lynn? I, I did see you. Well, I'm, um, I feel like we do have enough on our plate. There are a few things I know that we hope in the future, but at this point I think our focus is exactly what's stated here, so I'm comfortable with those goals is, and I appreciate um, the work uh, that's been done to narrow them down and, and get them addressed in a very succinct way. So physical, or physical challenges are certainly top of the list, so thank you. Um, yeah, I appreciate the succinctness as well, but taking a lot of things and putting together. I, I also have a concern just about the, the resources we have and getting all this done, and so this is a good, great list. I just wouldn't uh, be great if, I guess, if city manager could report back to us periodically about our progress and let us know if there's a resource issue or, or some, something that uh, might cause something to take longer than we might otherwise think. Yes, I did want to um, acknowledge that. It's, it is a, it's a very ambitious list. Uh, I do think that there is opportunity to make uh, strides incrementally on several of these goals. My recommendation would be that I come back to you quarterly 
to do a check-in that would allow council to give direction on to what maybe um, areas I could pull back on and what areas you would see as more of a priority. Um, and that would be very helpful to receive that direction. So I will work that through in um, our tentative schedule for the council meetings so that there's always um, a checkpoint and we don't want any surprises clearly so you know where everything is at. So I hope that that works for you and you'll look forward to seeing something from us um, every three months. Sounds good. I have a couple questions and a, a comment. Um, it mentions in here that if the council would like staff to explore legislative options that include exceeding the state sales tax cap, um, that you'd like formal direction from the council. So I'm wondering what that formal direction might look like if it were uh, something we would give you to, could give you tonight, if it's something we need a resolution for, if it's something we bring back to you after our, our, our uh, budget committee Actually, it's been in there it's quite simple. Um, yes. It would be um, as basic as what the languages and the staff recommendation would okay. be, and That's just simple. just to direct me to do that. Okay, and I would personally like that uh, as an option, and that's all it is right now. But to keep our options open. Absolutely. So, by just to follow up, I'll yes. just make sure I understand. Forgive me, Mayor. Uh, so, if we approve this, then you have the authority you need to contact our Sacramento representative. Yes, that's exactly what I need. Okay, great. Thanks, Jen. Yeah. Um, other question I have. Let's see. Um, under the the FSP, the Fiscal Sustainability Plan section, the very first sentence uh, reads, identify additional revenue enhancement options, including but not limited to increasing sales taxes, measure U, hotel taxes, and or modernizing the utility users tax. I see it does say, um, including but not limited to, then this would give us the ability to consider other uh, revenue measures as well. Yes, this is exactly why I worded it this way, so that the subcommittee could explore, could direct um, staff to come back with a variety of options for council's future consideration. Okay, okay, thanks for bringing that up, Lisa, because I was viewing this, there are two sections here under ensure long-term financial stability. I pictured the second section as being tied into the role of the budget subcommittee based upon the other staff report we approved tonight and the formation, because the, the language under the second subtitle, Update FSP Implementation Strategy Community Engagement Framework. That, I think those were the very words for the purpose of the subcommittee. So I was thinking this first section would be council and second section would be budget subcommittee. Would you're saying budget subcommittee could weigh in, in, in any of this? Yes, ultimately the subcommittee is making recommendations the council would give direction. So it, it's um, think of it as the subcommittee as a sounding board and to work through some of this before kind of the sausage making, if you will, okay. and then get to council to, to further refine and to provide direction. Okay, and I bring this up because just today somebody raised a question that council member Tim touched on recently, I think in our last council meeting, about possibility of a, of a marijuana tax, a cannabis tax, and, and I'm not really leaning in that direction at all, but since I'm hearing it, maybe it's something we should at least consider. So that's just one example of, there obviously there are many other kinds of revenue measures, but um, those are the kind of things that we, we might look at or we may not. Right, and the FSP is designed to be very fluid, so the council at any time could say, hey, you know, let's time out, um, move forward, backwards, whatever you want. So this is nothing that's written in stone, and again, this is uh, my assumption is why the council um, directed staff to come back with a resolution to establish the subcommittee to give that appropriate guidance. Okay, and then my... Last question uh, has to do with the, um, the maintain quality of life residents. We have a lot of uh, working with other jurisdictions to help ourselves and help them for the public purpose, whether it's grant funding or, or firefighting, whatever. And I see Scott's White Water mentioned in here. I'm just wondering if there's a, a role, somebody asked me this today also, if there's a place for San Lorenzo Valley Water District to be one of our partners, and I have nothing specific in mind, but I, I presume that if an opportunity arose, that we would reach out in that direction as well. Yes, this would lock us into not having conversations with them, and certainly something that I could bring up with the general manager. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Real quick, Mayor, I asked uh, city manager to consider adding the, the Scotts Valley uh, water outreach just on the, the the chance that there is an opportunity for us to partner with them on their uh, underground recharge opportunity that they're trying to pursue. If the city getting behind that, lending our credibility, saying that we're on board and, and are willing to work collaboratively to help make that happen, if, if 
that could help make uh, state grant money more uh, likely. That seems like a really good investment. I'm sure we would all agree. Okay, great. Yeah, the more collaborative we can be, the better. Okay, well, um, if there's no further discussion, um, can we have a motion? For more than council members? Um, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, <coughs> that, whoops, okay. I move that we adopt uh, the recommendation uh, attached to the uh, year 2019-20 goals and direct the city manager to work with state representatives to prepare a legislative adjustment to the state sales tax cap to consider a possible fiscal sustainability option. And is there anything else I have to adopt or adopt these, uh, formally adopt these goals as a city council? Or? That's it. Okay. And you need a second. I'll second that. Any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes unanimously. We'll move on to item five. Mid-year financial review for fiscal year 2018-19 and direction for preparation of the fiscal year 1920 annual budget. Um, Mr. McFarland. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, um, Mr. Mayor and members of council. Uh, tonight, I will be giving a progress update on the fiscal year 2018-19 budget and also asking for um, council direction and development of the 1920 budget. Um, including in my presentation tonight will be a very brief review of the fiscal year 2017-18 CAFR, um, also a review of the 2018-19 general fund uh, as of the six months ending December 31st uh, with some updated projections. Um, I will also have a uh, recommended appropriation request for fiscal year 2018-19. And we'll be moving on with budget assumptions for 1920 and uh, a recap of budget direction and action taken by the council and then a proposed 1920 budget calendar. So the review of the 17-18 CAFR, uh, we did receive an unmodified opinion, which uh, is a, a clean opinion, it's the highest opinion we can get. Uh, basically an unmod unmodified opinion says that the financial statements uh, present fairly in all material respects uh, the financial position of the city. Um, we closed fiscal year 17-18 with a general fund balance of 4.1 million. And also wanted to add, just for context, uh, we have a net pension liability of 17.1 million and a net OPEB liability of 14.1 million. Um, the net OPEB liability is a new, uh, as a result of the GASB pronouncement that went into effect uh, for this uh, fiscal year uh, financial statements. So they're now on our financial statements uh, as a liability. Moving on to the general fund, starting with the revenues. Um, chart on the screen is the revenues are broken down into categories, uh, taxes, franchise fees, uh, fines and forfeitures, charges for services, investments, and other revenue. Uh, the first two columns represent the, um, the last two fiscal years, 1617 and 1718. The uh, middle column is the budget for 1819. Uh, We're projecting 11.4 million in revenue. Uh, Currently, as of December 31st, uh, we have $5.3 million in revenue, so a little bit below 50%. Um, and we're, and uh, the, the last column is the estimated revenue for year end, and we're projecting um, $11.3 million. Um, so all the revenues increased over the prior year. Total general fund revenue is estimated to be 1% below projection of $11.4 million. Among the top three revenue categories, property tax is estimated to be 2% below projections and sales tax would be 4% below projections. On a positive note, TOT revenue is estimated to exceed projections by 9% with 1440 multiversity TOT revenue significantly exceeding projections. Moving on to general fund expenses. Uh, charts in a very similar format. Um, expenses are broken down by category. Uh, there's salaries and benefits, uh, operations, uh, maintenance, contributions, debt service, and capital. Again, the first two columns are the last two fiscal years, 16 and 17, the results. Uh, the middle column is the budget. We budgeted 11.9 million uh, in the general fund this year. Uh, the fourth column is uh, expenses as of December 31st with 5.8 million, uh, which is a little bit below 50%. And uh, we're projecting uh, revenue to be significantly below 
uh, budget expectations, and I'll, I'll go into that a little bit data, uh, later. Um, I wanted also to point out that we have included the transfers uh, category as well. Transfers are, are unique to fund accounting. Uh, in the financial accounting world, you can have multiple, you can have uh, discrete components, different operations, and they all roll up into one general ledger. With fund accounting, you have separate general ledgers with separate funds, and if you need to move cash from one fund to another, you have to do it through the transfer process, and that's why I've included the transfers um, in this uh, slide. So for the general fund, uh, significantly under budget due to turnovers and staff. Uh, new hires, lower salary steps, and vacant positions have resulted in salaries and benefits coming in under budget by approximately 285000 and also within the building department, we have budgeted over $600,000 for the chief building official and for building inspection services through contract. And although development revenue has is increased and there is activity, uh, we're not going to come close to the $600,000 this year. We're going to have about three to $400,000 in savings just there. Guys, in yeah. order to ask a question. Yeah. Um, the, so it sounds like the move to share a position with Capitola instead of, of having the consulting service provide building special services saved us significant money? Is that a true statement? Yes. The, what we budgeted for the sheet building official in, uh, was 125000 I think we'll be below that with sharing our services with the city of Capitol. Um, but the remaining amount was for contract building inspectors, and just we're not going to have the activity to get up to that amount that we budgeted for. Thank you. So with... The revised projections, um, we did budget, the 1819 budget was adopted with a, with a deficit, a projected deficit of 1.3 million, uh, with revenue almost at projections and expenses coming in below budget. Um, we're going to have, uh, this will be good news, um, we're not going to be in as much of a deficit as we are, that we, we're projecting. Uh, we're looking at, right now, uh, just a little bit under $600,000 in deficit. Uh, for 1819, so um, that's that's a positive note. So that the message is revenue is at projections, expenditures are below projections, and fund balance. We'll have a little bit more fund balance at the end of the year going into uh, going into 1920 that we were anticipating. Now, at this time during the year, this is appropriate for departments to review their budgets and to. Uh, make some corrections or requests based on uh, some new information that may have come across uh, post-adoption of the 1819 budget. Um, we do have some appropriation requests. Uh, the, the funds that are impacted will be the general fund, uh, the gas tax fund, the affordable housing fund, um, the STP exchange projects fund, and the transportation measure D fund. Um, and it's uh, most of these are the result of a, a roadway improvement project in Green Hills that um, was uh, was approved in last year's budget, was, but was anticipated to be completed before the 1819 budget was adopted. Um, there was a delay uh, with the, the bids came in higher than what the funding was, um, but it didn't get carried over into the 1819 budget. So there, we do have an appropriation request uh, to to. Uh, fund the cost that we, we spent on this project this year. Um, but uh, the overall impact of this increase in appropriation is $24,000, $400. Um, and for administrative services, we have a request of $20,000. Um, $7,000 is for staffing. Um, we do currently have two vacant positions based on retirement. One position is being currently filled by a retired annuitant. Um, the other position was an accounting assistant. Um, we need to upgrade that position to an accountant level um, just uh, for the needs of the department and also to uh, take some of the workload off of our senior accountant who is pretty much handling everything right now. Uh, we're anticipating that cost to be $7,000 for the rest of the fiscal year. Um, we're also, um, our auditing services contract expired at the, the end of the 17-18 audit. Um, so we're going to be issuing an RFP for new auditing services. Um, there could be potential costs in this fiscal year because some auditing firms like to do interim work prior to the end of the fiscal year. Uh, so we may have some costs. So uh, the total cost for administrative services is $20,000. Uh, the police are requesting $34,500. Uh, 
Uh, 10,600 is for the multidisciplinary interview center. This was an amount that uh, we received in January. Um, they seem to have their calendars a little bit off from fiscal year. They do their budget request calendar year, so uh, the chief has let me know that uh, the, the message has been sent to them to get their, their funding request to the city sooner. Also, their uh, RIM system, which is their operating system for uh, uh, police dispatching and records management, uh, the annual support was not included in the 1819 budget, uh, which is, uh, and that cost is $23,500. Uh, in order to pay for the additional requests in the general fund, we're, we're re recommending to reduce the, the building budget by $55,000. So there's a net zero uh, or $500 difference in the general fund. Um, in regards to the Green Hills Roadway Improvement Project, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Public Works Director Daryl Jordan, who will give you a brief overview of that project. Good evening, Council. In regards to the uh, Green Hills Roadway Preservation Project, the Council approved this project last May the 16th of 2018. This project consisted of 1.3 miles of pavement re rehabilitation and striping. The approved expenditure was a total of 989000 the majority of this funding was from the Regional Transportation Improvement Program known as our RTIP funding. During construction, additional concerns of pavement conditions were brought to the attention of staff. The area of concern was that the end of the project extends along Green Hills Road, beginning on South Navarro Drive and terminating at Granite Creek Road. This consisted of approximately 0.6 miles of additional roadway involving eight digouts and repairs, slurry, and providing new striping along that roadway. Although cost savings were made by having the contractor on site and performing the same scope of work, the total construction costs did exceed project approvals. However, additional dollars are available in Measure D funding as cited by the Finance Director. And in conclusion, I will ensure that Public Works will be working closely with finance in the event of any cost overruns in the future and that they are processed accordingly for the city protocols. Any questions? So as a result, um, the recommendation is to increase the, the funding sources for this project with the gas tax fund, uh, the exchange projects fund, and the Measure D fund. Um, so we'll be asking for additional appropriations in the gas tax fund of $80,109, um, the exchange projects fund of $811,000, offset by uh, revenue appropriations so we can receive grant revenue of $705,000 and additional appropriations in Measure D uh, funds, which are uh, 154,619. Uh, those funds are available in Measure D, uh, even though there has been appropriations in this year. Um, also, in the Affordable Housing Fund, we received notice from the county in regards to the Homeless Action Partnership uh, regarding uh, consulting services that they will be performing, um, that our cost is uh, $5,150. And also on the revenue side, we did receive a loan repayment of $210,000 and impact fees of $111,000. Uh, those were not anticipated in the 18-19 budget, so uh, we have received those funds, but we need to increase the appropriations so that we can receive them. So overall, the impact in the increase of these appropriations is a little bit over $24,000 uh, to the budget. <coughs> and before I move on, are there any questions? So in developing the 1920, uh, I looked at the budget assumptions that were um, included in the 1819 budget in, in context with the FSP. Uh, the 17% general fund reserve target, I'm recommending no change to that. Uh, there's a 2% inflation index for supplies and services, I'm also recommending no change. Um, we did have a health benefit increase of 3% uh, assumed in the budget. Uh, health benefits did actually, the cost of health benefits did actually increase higher than 3%. So I'm actually recommending an increase to 4% for the budget. Um, and also the PERS contribution rate increase, we're keeping that at 2%. And at this moment, I'm recommending no changes to the revenue assumptions, but I'm reserving the right to make any changes in the development if something comes up in the development of this budget, which I will be reviewing with the budget subcommittee. So in Anticipation of the 1920 budget and also keeping in mind of some of the goals of ensuring long-range financial sustainability. Uh, we do have a couple of options that I would like to uh, bring to Council's attention. Uh, one is our UAL prepayment. Uh, last year was the first year that we did 
AUL prepayment and uh, generated about $36,000 in savings. Um, this year, um, our UAL balance as of 17-18 um, is $16.5 million, um, and that's represented in the first column uh, on the slide. I've broken it down by the four uh, PERS um, plans that we have. We have two classic plans, one for miscellaneous, one for safety, and we have two PEPPER plans, safety and miscellaneous. Um, total is $16.5 million. Um, our UAL payment for this year is $1.15 million. Um, if we do a prepayment, it's going to be $1.1 million, so that's going to generate $40,000 in savings. However, I would like to recommend to Council that uh, we take some of those savings and apply it to the UAL and the PEPPER plans, um, which right now is a balance of $26,000 between the two, and keep the UAL close to zero in those two plans as we transition out of classic miscellaneous and classic safety and more new hires are coming into PEPRA, I would like to keep a lid on the UAL payments for PEPRA uh, for safety and miscellaneous. So as, as an ongoing practice that we continue doing the prepayment but completely pay the UALs for the, for the PEPRA plans. I think that will help keep those UALs in check for the PEPRA plans and um, the classic plans are I mean, we're, we just do not have enough funding to, to address those at this time. Um, but kind of think of these as credit cards. We have four credit cards, and we need to pay down the balances as we go. So, um, so that's so we, we need budget direction from council, so or so approve from council to uh, to adopt this as a policy. Um, the second item is um, we have three COPs. Uh, one is a 1997 issue of 5.3 million. Uh, we have a 2003 issue of, that has a remaining balance of 954 million, and a 2013 COP of 8 million. And it's a total of 14.2 million. Um, what I have on the on the this, on the chart right now is payments from 2020 to 2027. And um, in 2027, we have a significant increase. Uh, of almost $500,000, uh, $1.5 million, um, and, and it's a, a balloon payment in, related to the 1997 uh, capital appreciation bond. Um, there was a refunding done at some point, and um, there was a reserve in this capital appreciation bond that was cashed out for the refunding. So as a, as a result of the refunding, that $500,000 reserve was added to the last payment in 2026-2027. We've been approached by NHA advisors. They've advised us that we have two COP refunding opportunities. Um, the total measure is 14 million in the remaining debt service. If we refund, we can, one is, we can refund at 12.8 million. The other one's at almost 13 million. My recommendation would be to refund at the 12.8 million. And then the savings that we have for each year that we bank in a reserve fund in order to build up a reserve level to address the um, balloon payment in 2027-2028, or excuse me, 2026-2027. Um, if you look at the last column, that's the cumulative savings. We could be receiving about $50,000 per year with this refunding, um, but by 2025-2026, the POB um, will expire, and that will reduce our debt service payment by $440,000. I would recommend that we transfer that payment in 2025-26 into the reserve so that by 2026-2027, the reserve would have $1.5 million and that would cover the debt service. This would, this would reduce the strain on the general fund um, over the years. And um, so that is my recommendation that we have this strategy. Yes. Yeah, I'm trying to put the pieces together. You mentioned something about saving fifty thousand dollars a year by refinancing. Are you suggesting now that we not refinance that we take the, the money that will that will uh, arrive later and use that? No, I'm suggesting that if we look at what's currently in the debt service with the refunding, is there's going to be a reduction right. of okay. fifty thousand. So each year there's fifty thousand. So we still budget for what the original debt service was for, okay. but we pay the debt service based oh, on the refunding schedule and take the savings of putting in a reserve fund that builds up a balance each year until we get to the last year and then make that payment. 
Yeah. May, may I tactfully suggest for the future that we never have balloon payments? Yes. That we have I nice totally agree. Payments. Because I totally agree. We don't, don't like those kind of surprises, you know. Yes. Anyway, thank you. Yeah. That's my question. Yeah, for so. Uh, so that's my recommendation for uh, a COP refunding um, strategy. So to recap, council action is required for the following to approve the recommended appropriation requests, which are on resolution um, 630.38.3, and also to approve the recommended UAL prepayment and debt service refunding strategies. And um, if there are any questions before I move to the council? I have a couple. Yep. Um, first, uh, you showed us, one of the first charts you showed us, uh, showed the OPEP liability, yes. uh, their post-employment benefit liability. Mm -hmm. um, and as I recall, what we're doing is we're, um, we, we're pay-as-you-go for a long time, just paying the current health bills for retirees yep. and not paying anything that against this unfunded uh, right. liability. Um, but now I believe we're paying 25% of of some number each year. I think, I'm not sure if that's the increase in the liability of what it is, but we're starting to put money aside, I believe, to take care of uh, part of that. But that tells, but that reminds me that, um, just I just want to mention that, or highlight the fact that that means while we're doing a good job, finally starting to pay part of the unfunded liability off, that unfunded liability uh, will continue to grow, I believe. Yes. I'm understanding right. Uh, just like our pension and, and so, uh, so I would, to the extent we can think about ways to, uh, and I love what some of your other suggestions, but I think we can do to maybe increase what we're paying against the unfunded liability for the OPEP in the future, um, it would stand as well because it costs us a lot of money. And my other question is, um, thinking back to when uh, we saw previous projections, I think when we first did the fiscal sustainability plan um, and looked at our projections, I believe we were going to hit uh, our, our minimum reserve balance in the general fund uh, that, that we've adopted as a policy is 17%. And I believe we were going to hit that number in June of 19, if I remember the numbers right. And now that's being pushed back because we've cut the, uh, uh, for a number of reasons, but one of which you're showing us that instead of having a deficit this year, 1.2 million, we, it's only 500,000. So that is, as you pointed out, uh, giving us a little more breathing room um, moving moving down the road, right. um, and so, uh, uh, and I'm trying to remember, you showed us some numbers, I think, at the last council meeting, but I believe that um, we're now, we hit the 17% in June of 2020, does that yeah. sound right, yes. more or less? Yes. Okay, I bring that up because uh, I know we're, we're seeing it coming, I know we're adopting plans, we're going to talk about what strategies we take, but I'll be uncomfortable when we dip under that 17%. Yes. Uh, minimum reserve because I consider that 17% as a council we agreed that was a reasonable number but ultimately I'd like to get that, that up to a higher number but I recognize we can't take on all of our issues at one time so for me that really is a minimum so um, I just want to remind uh, myself and everyone else that um, we're nearing that point where that's a real issue when we're under a minimum reserve. Yeah the forecast will be updated quite a bit. It's a, it's a fluid document. Other comments or questions? Um, if not, um, I'd entertain a motion or two. Before you do the motion, can I make a clarification on your direction? Um, so obviously you need to accept the TACH reports regarding the mid-year, but with respect to um, the providing direction on the UAL and the refunding, if we want to embed this as a budget uh, policy with respect to the UAL, I would recommend that you give us um, direction that you'd like us to proceed with a policy document that we would return to you as a part of the 1920 budget, so you can codify that practice, um, and then we would just need regular direction if you agree with the refunding to say please move forward with that. Okay. And on the first, just to be clear, if I understood it right, um, I know this year we did pay off, some, we, we paid early some of our uh, unfunded liability that we would do anyway. But if I understood the finance director, the administrative service director correctly, um, we're talking about paying the, the full PEPRA unfunded liability each year or the, the amount that's... The full amount of the UAL for the PEPRA plan. Yes, yeah. as, a, as a first cut. And perhaps still pay, prepaying um, 
the rest of it early in the year. Yeah, we'll, we'll, pre we'll prepay everything at the beginning of the year, whatever the prepay amount is for the classic plans. Mm -hmm. But for the pepper plans, there is a prepayment amount. I'm saying no, we'll pay the UAL amount. Full amount. Full okay. amount UAL. I, I like that. I would caution that as our fund balance drops, that cash flow wise, we need to be careful that we have that million dollars in the bank to be able to pay. Prepay, even though I like the prepaying, I right. want to make sure we have enough cash to be able to, to do that. So uh, that's the only caveat I have. Um, so and but, before you do a motion, I still have to finish. <laughs> we still have to go with the budget calendar. Oh, okay. So, My apologies. Um, yeah. So this is the proposed budget calendar, um, beginning with tonight, February sixth, to uh, have a mid-year financial report and budget direction. Um, March, and this is proposed. Uh, this is not set in stone. Um, March 13th, we're, it's our first budget subcommittee meeting, and here they will, the budget subcommittee will review the five-year CIP plan and the FSP framework and budget direction. March 20th is a regular meeting where we will uh, present the five-year CIP plan to, uh, for, for council direction. Uh, April 10th is uh, another budget subcommittee meeting uh, where they will review the fee, the fee schedule and also update the FSP strategy development and budget direction. Um, April 17th is a regular meeting. This will be the adoption of the fee schedule. Uh, May 1st is a regular meeting where there will be a uh, review of the nonprofit funding proposals. Uh, May 8th will be a budget subcommittee meeting uh, where they'll review the proposed F uh, 1920 annual budget and also update any FSP strategy implementation action plan. Uh, May 15th is a regular meeting where this is the public hearing on the proposed 1920 budget. June 5th is a regular meeting with the adoption of the budget, and June 28th will be the budget publication. Um, we're planning to have the second meeting of each month be dedicated to any budget item, um, and then having the budget subcommittee meet at least a week before so they can give us their input and we can make any, any, any changes to the staff and reports before the agendas are due on Friday. Um, so if there are any questions on the budget count. Any questions? I have one that's, I think, a subset of it, having to do with the uh, review nonprofit funding proposals. I had a local um, agency the other day approached me. Uh, they're not currently receiving any funding from the city, but they're interested in, in putting in a request. So I wanted to, uh, and I know we tend to um, receive, a, you know, we have this presentation by the Human Care Alliance. We tend to look at the same groups every year, and we don't have a lot of resources to, to explore all the the merits of every one of those organizations, but I wanted to plant the idea or ask the question, can we fold in here somehow the ability for a new entity to make a request for, for funding? That would be at the direction of the council. Here? <laughs> Generally, when there is, unless it's something separate, it goes through human, they can apply and be incorporated and, okay. and be folded in and they all work together. You're correct, and I don't know whether or not this organization is... We can is, refer them to them and yeah. see if they can do that, because they all coordinate. And they're newly located in Scotts Valley, so they may or may not be part of that presentation. And they need to know, yeah. Yeah, okay, great, so I will, uh, I will pass that message back. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Okay, so back to the motions. It sounds like one of the motions we need is to um, adopt the policies, and I think I heard two. One had to do with paying off the full PEPRA uh, unfunded liability at the beginning of each year <coughs> for those plans um, in full, as I said, and, uh, and also, uh, just to codify, prepaying the full, do that first, and then prepay the full uh, payments that we would on the fund liability for the other plans, uh, assuming there's sufficient cash. Is that okay? And so that would be the first motion. I know that was a mouthful. So moved. Is there a second? Yes. Any comments or questions? If not, uh, all in favor of that policy, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. So the second policy that we would adopt only had to do with the refunding of our, of our debt, of our certificates of participation. And if I understood it right, that we would use the, the money that becomes um, available when we stop paying one of our debts, we would use that to, uh, to cover the, what I'll call it the shortfall, or, or uh, in, uh, uh, how 
I say it cover the bump that would otherwise be there. That's not a technical term, I know it's cover, cover the bump in our in our uh, existing debt service for the COPs. Did I say it right? Yes. Is there something else that needs to be said? Um, for more precisely. Other than, uh, other than just saying taking the, the, the savings identified from the refunding and depositing it into a reserve fund. That's to, cover, to cover a balloon payment. Okay. I'd entertain a motion for that. So moved. For a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes unanimously. And there's the resolution for that appropriation interest. Yeah. I'll move approval uh, resolution number 630.38.3. And wait, we do And read it. It doesn't matter. That's for ordinances. That's ordinances. Yeah. Ordinance is only perfect. That's ordinance. Okay. Thank you. That's right. I'm worried. Okay. Um, any comments on that? Not all those in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passed unanimously. Uh, we, we got to all the motions? Right? You got through all the motions, and, and because that policy direction is so crystal clear, um, <laughs> you will see this information presented to you again um, as a part of the budget. So we will make it um, clear in writing for you what um, that actually means, and we'll articulate that practice for you. Thank you. Um, oh, I'm sorry, there's one thing I forgot to add. Um, with the refunding of the COP, um, NHA advisors will be doing uh, an analysis of the cash flow, including the POV debt service, including the COP and the refunding, and they will also include um, costing models for contribution rates with PERS and including the discount rate as well. So they're going to be doing this type of analysis for us. They're, they're very excited uh, to do this analysis for us. And they'll be bringing it back in April. And when they look at refunding, still look at the cash flow differences between having reserves and not having. Right. What's, what sparked their interest was this spike in the, this, this balloon payment in 2027. Mm -hmm. 